Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to this space we are having tonight, where we'll be discussing the Imo State gubernatorial race. Co-hosting the space with me is Ms. Pels, a fearless, courageous, and outspoken, obedient lady who has been giving us clear, verifiable um, updates from the court. We can't thank her enough for her dedication and the fearless service to humanity that she has come to practice. We really appreciate her for that. So tonight we'll be discussing the Imo State gubernatorial race, starting with the LP candidates. And uh, our guest tonight is the Deputy Labour Party uh, candidate for the Imo State gubernatorial election, Honorable Tony uh, please, before I bring him up here, please, if you are here already, um, I, I beg you to please share this space on your timeline so we have more people to join up for us to, to have a very interactive session. So I, I, I had the opportunity of um, taking some time from his busy schedule a few, few days ago discussing about the Emo State election, and we, we had a very, very um, brilliant conversation about the plan they have and... Um, the chances that Imo State has to be a better state that people, that the Imo Light can be so proud of. So after the conversation, I thought that, oh, I think I should bring him here on space for, for obedience to really engage with him. Because one thing I am really big on is information. Information and access to our leaders, access to especially, especially our political leaders. Because I believe that democracy can really thrive in a situation where there is an open access between the people and their elected official. And that open access gives room for credible information to go around because I strongly believe that an informed citizenry is the best bet for our democratic advancement. So I spoke with him and like, hey, uh, Chief, give us some some of your time. Let me bring you up sp or space and let's interact with uh, with obedience. Let's interact with the people. And he quickly jumped on the idea. And tonight we have him here. Our, gu uh, our, our guest tonight, Honorable Tony Ulu, well, was a former House of Rep member in the. I think in the in the eighth assembly, he 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 was notable for the sponsorship of a very important bill that is the non to uh, not too young to run bill that uh, was able to 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 be the framework for young people interested in politics, young people unsure of. Uh, of, of, of their political uh, aspiration, of their political ambition, they were able to create a blueprint, a framework for young people to start picking interest, start getting the chance to have a say, to have a say in the political space. Let me add them up. So you're welcome, Honorable. Thank you so much for creating our time to, to, to join us. Um, Honorable Tony Owulido is, is the Deputy Labour, Labour Party candidate for the Imo State's gubernatorial election. So Honorable, you have the mic now. Um, I think you might want to tell us more about yourself and um, the inspiration behind the Not Too Young to Run bill, which you are notable for, and how you were able to uh, move through that journey, seeing the bill from a bill, and today we have an act. Thank you, Yusuf and uh, Pearls, and uh, good evening, listeners. My name is Tony Molo, and um, I, well, I am here to interact with you on my nomination as the deputy governorship candidate of Labour in Imo States, and to answer your question. Uh, Yes, well, it was um, it was both emotional and um, quite a feat to achieve in those days. I represented the Shadisola Federal Constituency. I won election under the platform of PDP in 2015, and uh, it was a keenly contested um, election. But to God be the glory, I was able to make it to the National Assembly and through the help of my, my uh, constituents that also believe in what I'm able to bring to bear. So yeah, we, the eight, eight assembly set off and I recall a certain day, uh, Mr. Samson Itodo 
came to me and told me about their their efforts during the past assembly to get the uh, get the uh, national assembly to reduce to pass uh, a bill reducing the age for running for office in Nigeria. And um, well, after after a few discussions with him, I told him, okay, fine. Let's let's get this done, and that was how the journey that would take number of months, number of years, persuasions, and all of that to achieve. And considering our uh, political space, where the young people, I, I recall, if most of you will remember, some years back. Politics was seen as the exclusive re uh, reserve for, exclusively reserved for the elderly. So the, the best, the best position that was actually reserved for the youth leaders, you also saw people that were above 50 or 60 occupying the youth leadership positions, both in political parties at that time. So no, nobody really gave the young people that opportunity to get involved in mainstream politics, you know. And uh, uh, for me also, little did I know, because I got to the house at, at the age of 36, little did I know that I was going to be sitting with people older than my father. So, and to avoid somebody calling me, come this boy, go and sit down here, or this boy, get out of here, I had to, I had to change a whole lot of things, including my wardrobe, to to look and uh, you know to make me feel like I'm as old as they are, and probably that's that's um, that's what led to the too many gray hairs I'm seeing now. Like I'm, I'm uh, they made me run faster than my age. But be that as it may, the I jumped on that task brought to me by Yaga Africa, and um, we started the journey. We started the lobbying, and uh, first and foremost, we needed, we needed to build a cohesion. We needed to build a movement. We needed everyone to, because we knew what we were up against, you know. The system we, we were dealing with was one that was not going to allow the young people to participate. And what they were doing. So that took us to engaging many um, many agencies. You know, a lot of work was put put uh, to see that come true. You know, because we needed we needed uh, both the international community to persuade to persuade the government to ensure that that bill saw the light of day. And I, I think I've discussed that. I'm always a regular in most of your spaces, really. Uh, you know, so I recall discussing that that process in one of the spaces I, I came into, where at some point, we, at some point, uh, the uh, uh, Yaga, Yaga, who was the... Uh, I mean, they, they conceptualized this whole thing and then they got other sister civil society agencies. They organized all of what needed to be organized and they provided they provided enough uh, technical support at the background to ensure that we're able to do what we needed to do. But I also recall that there was a time it looked like this was going to, to also be thrown off like it was in the previous assemblies. You know, I remember. I remember a time I, I was in I was in UK for an engagement when uh, I received a call from my brother and friend, the executive director of Yaga Africa, that the bill didn't make it through the Constitution Review Committee, and rightly so because they had the chairman and a few other members had reached out to me earlier before they left for that considerations in Lagos. And they told me that we needed to, we needed to, you know how it is with Nigeria factor. We needed to come and uh, see them. But um, I told them no. The young people do not have money or anything to offer to the committee. 
And uh, they told me, well, if that is not going to happen, then the bill was not going to see the light of day. I thought they were bluffing. But truly, as they said it, the bill was killed in Lagos. And they came back to Abuja without that bill. And something called me and told me, look, our efforts are gone. These guys are not going to consider this. I told him, no, give me some time, I'll get back to you. I made a few calls. Uh, details uh, of what happened and transpired may not be necessary now, but yes, there were some um, there were some persuasions and lobbying done to ensure. And when I mean lobbying, please, it had nothing to do with financial because I mean the young people didn't have money to present or give to anybody, as as it were. So I was able to uh, persuade and persuade. And after a while, he called me back and asked me, "What did I do?" I told him, "Well, good thing the bill is back," and that's that was the beginning of that journey to seeing the bill being passed. Uh, after that was done, uh, the next was the politics of the National Assembly to get it to be passed. And again, I faced another hurdle, or we faced another hurdle, which was uh, getting the Northern Caucus in the House to accept. And you know, in the House of Reps, whatever the Northern Caucus does not support will not see the light of day. So that became another stumbling block, you know, and they were not in support of the bill. I may also state clearly here that for political reasons, Lagos State also was not in support of the bill. That is my own state where I was represented. And I can understand the fact that that was a uh, politics between PDP and APC. So, and that also earned Lagos a place in the, in the, uh, not too young to run Hall of Shame. But beyond that, they, we needed to persuade the Northern Caucus to, you know, but, you know, there, for, our, for my Northern colleagues, they don't believe that the young people should come to the National Assembly to start with. They don't believe that the young people and only a few women could survive that too. They don't also believe that women should make it there. You know. They believe that the young people should uh, stay away from governance. So getting them, persuading them, and I give it to the young people actually, because when we faced that, we had to ensure that their numbers, their phone numbers were released publicly, and we got their constituents to engage them directly. And there wasn't anything we didn't do. And a lot of um, uh, young people started. The young people, in fact, the truth about it is that the naughty young to run was not just my efforts. I must, I must give it to the Nigerian people because I mean they were ready for that at that same time too, just like we've seen uh, happen in the election. Also, we've also seen that level of organization uh, during the answers. So I believe that the young to run was also something that the time was right. Yes, I know that at some point I, I also led led the protests that had over 2,000 young people coming from different parts of this country. And that was after we had successfully uh, uh, gone through that of the National Assembly and we got, we got all the members to accept and uh, the, that was done from the National Assembly. The, 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 next, the next problem was getting Mr. President, who also, uh, a former president, who also is an author, to assent to the bill, you know. So, and there was there was an uncalled delay, you know. And I also led the young people, over 2,000 of them, like I said, on that protest, where if most of you saw the video, actually, we actually blocked, blocked all the, all the entrances and exits to the villa. Um, yeah, I recall. I recall. Um, I recall. Uh, honorable, let me let's, 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 let, let me let me stop you there and let's quickly get into the real business business of the day. Let's let's dive into the poll now. Uh, I because I, I want to believe that uh, your 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 aligning with the Labour Party, a party that 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 that, that uh, is really driven by young people, especially the obedient movement, is a testament of the fact that you really have a vision 
you really have a vision to see young people taking on their political power. You really have a vision to see the political consciousness in young people being awakened. So let's let's quickly go to the business of the day, and I'll quickly pass the mic to my co-host here, Pels, for her to um, coordinate from there. Um, quickly, before that, please let me just quickly announce here that we are going to give the room for people to really ask questions. We're, we're going to throw the floor open for people to really ask questions. We really want to have a clear and open conversation with the host here. So please, if you have a question, request for the mic. We'll get to the time and we'll definitely grant your request for you to speak and ask your question. Please also, if you are here, please also do help us share this space on your timeline so we get more people to join in. Thank you very much once again for joining. Ms. Pels, Pell, please, you have the mic. Okay, thank you so very much. So hello, everyone. Good day. Um, from wherever you're joining us from, welcome once again to this space. I'm so very glad to be here and co-hosting with my brother, F.S. Yusuf. Welcome once again, Honorable Tony. You've done a very good job of introducing yourself and giving like a brief overview of what you do generally. But I have a couple of questions for you, and I'm going to be very blunt in my questions, sir. So please get ready for them. <laughs> And then um, before I go ahead, um, like my brother has said, do well to share this space. Um, you want to get uh, um, as many people as possible in here to come have this conversation with us. So, Honorable, um, my first question for you has to do with the primaries, the Labour Party primaries. So, um, we were made to understand that your principal, Afan Achano, um, was given a million dollars by Governor Herb Uzodima which he eventually used to bribe his way to clinch the ticket, the party ticket. So do you want to tell us why he did that and how he did that? All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bells. And, um, well, you said I should expect blunt questions, so you should also expect blunt answers. Um, and... Um, bluntly answering you, there was nothing like that. There was nothing like that. It's um, and as you all know too, or uh, you may not know actually, I know that that uh, phone conversation that involved some individuals in Imo, that they also mentioned the former governor of Imo State, uh, Governor That uh, phone call had been taken up by the by Governor Ikedo Hakim, and I believe one of the individuals that spoke on that recording is currently in detention by Governor Hopo Zadema, who is, by the way, APC, not Labour Party. So that was, uh, at best, I would say that was uh, a, a feeble attempt to, to mudsling my principle. I, I, we've been waiting to know what next they have lined up. But then anybody that knows Senator Khan will laugh that off because one, if you, I mean, it's it's even unthinkable that anybody would suggest that Hope Zadema would, would uh, bribe, bribe him with a million dollars. I mean, it's quite laughable. That's the best way we've taken it. One, uh, for the for those in APC, we see that as as uh, uh, the last uh, the last efforts of a drowning of a drowning uh, party in Imo when they they failed to deliver deliver their on their promises, you know. So basically, I, I want to also use this opportunity to to seduce people's mind on that. It's there was something like that, you know, like they say. I, I think this also that conversation came out from the primaries when some some of the uh, contestants, uh, our supporters, they didn't get it. And it's very normal in politics for people to muscling and throw come up with uh, throw tantrums and all of that and, and all that. But then, they, they, like I always will say. People should also be very careful the things they say because now you have you have a, a family man in detention because of his utterances and like I said it's a, it's an APC problem uh, between them and whoever they they 
it was a conjecture of their mind and whatever thing they they see they take uh, for us in labor we have uh, we have a huge task of truly rescuing emo states and i think that is our focus at the moment we are facing an existential threat and like they say when your house is on fire you don't go chasing rats so those are usual distractions that you see when they see a major force coming to take them off. They come up with uh, all of those stories. But trust me, the emo state we're talking about giving out this money is already at the verge of um, insolvency. So, and it's not like we have a very responsible leadership currently in emo states. So I don't think um, any any smart person wouldn't even look at that at all. Okay. It's, it's just, Okay, that that's very interesting. So you you're trying to say those allegations are false; they're totally not not true. They are at best laughable, not just untrue, but also uh, it it only exists in the imaginations or minds of the people that actually. But I also told you there was subsequently there was a um, there was a uh, disclaimers being put out in the media by the so-called persons, the, I mean, the, the people that were involved in those phone calls. And also, as I speak to you, as of two days ago, one of the people involved in that phone call was picked up and currently uh, is in detention at the first headquarters and was arrested by former Governor Hope, uh, former Governor Ohakim, who is a strong ally of Pope Ozadema, who is alleged to have given the money. So you see that this whole thing is a confusion in their camp. You know, it was um, it was a, a script poorly executed by them. And I think uh, maybe they would have to sort themselves out. Okay. So I mean, otherwise, there is no out of truth in that particular. Oh, okay, interesting. So you see, in most states, um, from what I know, they have a myriad of problems they are facing. And one of the major ones is insecurity. And um, there is this general belief that um, General Ogunewe would have made a better candidate because, of course, him being a general, he would be able um, to tackle the insecurity in Imo State. Don't you think he would have made a better candidate than your principal? Okay, le let me also stay before even... Uh, going there, I have seen someone also write that. What about the the bribe bribe allegations uh, on, against my principal on the day of the primaries? Mm -hmm. Let me also state it clearly here that uh, for those that might be politically naive, it's always good to explain most of these processes uh, the world over. Primaries are keenly contested, and the thing about primary, you don't bribe people during the primaries, you might provide some form of logistics for the delegates that are coming as such. And when people say uh, my principal bribed delegates, I laugh at that. I laugh at that because it's like uh, two persons coming in to war, to war a beautiful woman, and then another person succeeds then you turn around and begin to cast all forms of expression. But the, the, the issue here is that if you had also won, you wouldn't say those things you're saying. I believe that primaries requires people preparing very well for that. Um, uh, there, were, there were lots of persons that contested for the primary, so I'm not going to mention just one individual. You know, A lot of persons contested for the primary. Some got one vote. Some didn't get any vote at all. Some got more than, but then, mind you, in politics, you must spend something. You are either spending currency, whichever currency you're spending. You're either spending currency or you're spending your social capital. But during the primaries, you must spend something. And that is why you must be intentional before joining any of these races to know what are you bringing. There are going to be delegates in other developed countries. You might give them gift vouchers. You might give them whatever it is, to appreciate them. It might be uh, coupons and all of that. So you're not going to 
change what has been in practice when it comes to ours. Are there delegates? Yes. These delegates leave their different localities to make their way to those places. You should at least provide them with transportation or other things. If someone is starving, you should give the person food to eat. So in most cases, you see these things being monetized. Let us not make it look like um, two persons are sinning, but because you're sinning differently. No. The question is, you are going to woe people to vote for you. And these people are leaving. They're inconveniencing themselves to come to the venue where these things are meant to be. You should at least provide logistics for them. And like I also said, there are also circumstances where somebody might monetize the logistics and give the delegates the money. And the other party that didn't spend anything, I mean, didn't give money, will still emerge victorious. Why? Because the person has built or has acquired lots of social capital in the past. Oh, people know you in the community. You're that guy that runs errands without asking for tips. You're the, you're the person in the church. You're the usher in the church that makes sure everybody sits while you stand. People know you as someone that greets them very well. You're respectful. There are lots of things that will earn you social capital. And at some point in your life, so those social capital might be deployed in circumstances that you may need to do more. It might be in points of leadership. And people will look at you and say, oh, this young man has done well for our community. He's always been the one ensuring that our markets, our market square is clean. He's always ensuring that the hall or the church is clean. And now he wants to represent us somewhere because he has paid his dues in all other things, no matter what money another person brings us during the primaries, because of this singular uh, act of charity or whatever he's been doing or he's been known for in the past, we're going to vote for him. So you must come with something that the people must relate with. It's either you're com like I said, but do not expect that because you're tall and you have you have a, you have a gap tooth and you're a handsome man and then you have six packs, people will come and vote for you. It doesn't work like that. There must be something people are rallying around on you. Either you have acquired social capital in the past and they are going to relate with you based on that, or you're going to provide at, at least the logistics to cater for that person that is living some uh, 50 kilometers to come to the venue to come and cast their vote. So I, I don't think the thing about bribery should even be mentioned. Nobody bribed anybody, not them. Not the, but then if you also want to ask whether everybody provided logistics, everyone did. Those that did, did. And I mean, it's not up to the voters to choose who they wanted. And they, and at best, the primaries have come and gone. Someone has won, and someone is the Labour Party candidate at the moment. Now, to your question about security and uh, General Ognewil, I, I must give it to him. He's my elder brother, and he had a very Stalin military outing. You know, I mean, he represented this country very well in the military, and uh, he's, he's had a, a fantastic military career. I must give it to him one of our best. But to the question about being a military and solving insecurity in Imo State, there is no empirical evidence that being a military or uh, a military general in the past has directly solved insecurity in any way. And if there's anything to, to reference to, the very last administration we had had um, Major General uh, Muhammad Buhari uh, that just left. And at the at, at the peak of at the peak of what we thought Jonathan couldn't do in 2015, a lot of people opted out for Buhari because of the insecurity and all of that that was rising. But now we've even come to find out if you were to compare the both regimes that Jonathan did better than Buhari when it comes to insecurity because Buhari didn't only, I mean, uh, then we recall that the Chibok girls were, were uh, uh, abducted. But after eight years, the Chibok girls are still abducted. After eight years of uh, Buhari's regime, Nigeria, Nigerians feel more insecure. After eight years of his regime, our economy didn't do any better. So all the things we feared that Jonathan couldn't do, under Buhari, I've seen a lot of people online say, oh, no, please return us back to where you, you took us from. You see, a lot of people have been clamoring, no, return us. We, under Buhari's regime, we've seen the, the, what dollar had risen to, We've seen corruption that we thought, oh, because people believe that during his military regime, there was uh, a whole lot of uh, corruption charges brought uh, against some persons and individuals 
that he's a no-nonsense person. But Buhari's regime has also seen Nigeria become one of the corruption hubs in the world. So if all if you if you were to really look at it from the military background, I, I, would, I would tell you that his military background actually left us worse than we than the civilian background actually did for us. So it's really, and also, if you're looking at the insecurity in Indo State, you find out also that most often when you approach conventional issue, if you approach unconventional sociopolitical situations with conventional approaches, you may not really get it right. You know, we saw that even during the, during the, of us and just regime, a bit of it then during the uh, Zaki Bram Udi massacre. Most times the military might think that the best option is to is to go immediately and flush out people and all of that. But most often you also find out that negotiations, bringing people, bringing agitators to the table will solve that. We saw that during the uh, Ogoni, Ogoni uh, spillages and all the rest of them, that the military also had to execute Kensaro we were, you know. But then we, we saw a Yaradua during his presidency that had to invite the agitators from the Niger Delta. You know, they, he invited them to the, to the villa. They all came and they had a round table talk and that led to the multiple bombings and oil spillages we saw in the Niger Delta region in those days when we used to have the Ebisu boys and all the rest of them. All those things were, were resolved through mediation you have agitators, what do you do? You bring them to the table and find the best suitable unconventional approaches to resolving this thing. So I do not really believe that the, the military, a military background has any effects whatsoever in securing persons or ensuring uh, uh, security in anywhere. And I, I, I've, I've shared most of these data with you so you could tell for yourself, mm -hmm. I mean, for us in Nigeria, we we didn't feel any safer with Buhari being there, and we, we we never felt any safer. All true. I mean, under his regime, we saw banditry, we saw a whole lot of um, headsmen, this, that, that. But he was a military general, so it really has no correlation with that to start with. And for the insecurity in Imo State, I would always say that Imo State is our state. It's not like. Uh, there are no, uh, we have 660 communities in Imo State. And in all those communities, they all know themselves. If there are agitators, I only believe that what our administration will do differently is to call everyone to a round table. And honestly speaking, if there are people that are hot or that are still hot, in, you, you discuss all of this with them. You don't. You don't uh, go to, like we've seen in this administration, current regime of the present APC led Imo states, invite the military to come and bombard that area. You're killing your own people, and then you call that bringing about peace. That does not, that, that does not in any way solve any problem. You don't, a, a child does not cry, and then you feel that the best way to, to stop the child crying is to beat him on top of that. That's crude. And that's cruel. You should first and foremost find out what, why is this child crying and attempt to solve those issues. The, the youths we're talking about are our youths. Under whatever names you give them, call them known or unknown gun men. Call them whatever it is you choose to call them. Issue is that what we're facing in the Southeast has not gotten close to what it used to be in the South-South. And it was, still, it was still dealt with. It was still resolved. And the only way to resolve these things most times is still that sociopolitical engagements and dialogues. Bring everybody to the table. Find out what are they agitating after. What is it that the government has not done for them over the years that they are they are not happy? Do they feel included in in the running of affairs of the states or neglected? We currently, from the records, we're having youths from between 15 to 22 years, making it to the psychiatric world. What, what is triggering this whole use of drug abuse? From drug, what else do they do? They take into crimes. You, you know, they take to crimes and all that. How do you begin to harness these segments, this demography, so that they don't continue with these vices? Those are the things we should look at. And like um, 
my principal has also said, part of the problems with all of this is governance, majorly not governance. We have the local government system, so to speak. You know, because when you talk about insecurity, it's all inclusive, it affects everything. Without us securing the state, investments will not thrive, investors will not come. Like we've not seen any single foreign direct mm -hmm. investment in Imo states. And if the locals are not investing, why will foreigners come in to put their money in an insecure environment? You know. So until we're able to look deeply into the local government funds management also. We've talked about autonomy. Are the local governments truly autonomous? And the, my principal has said this is one of his cardinal things. And I say this thing so that even when, by the grace of God, we assume leadership, we will be held accountable for all the things we're saying out here today. He said it over and over again that the local government funds must go to them. If the local government funds goes to them and you have elected, elected, not selected, councillors, from their words, representing different words in Imo states. And those words have their needs and the rest of them. You begin to see people feeling uh, uh, included. The inclusion will come, not when the funds come. The local government chairman doesn't know what happens to his money and then a little is given to them to just pay for salaries of working and then a few ghost workers and then that goes to the private pockets. That is not leadership and that's not governance. And there is no way you continue to push people down and not expect uh, um, such reprisals. It would happen. You can, you, you can only hold people down for a few times. People will rise up. So that is why if you do not, if you not ad truly, truly and honestly address agitations and agitators, you're only postponing the doomsday. It will still come up someday. And we just pray it doesn't get beyond what it is at the moment because for us in Imo State, we are facing an existential threat. Okay. In Imo State, we are internally displaced. You, have, you hardly have people that are willing to go back to their states and feel safe. We have our people in the diaspora that want to come home. They are they feel insecure. We've seen a few that came home and never made it back to their families where they are coming from. So it's, it's a very serious issue for us that our young people that are doing well, even, I mean, as it stands in Imo states, planning an event in Imo is nightmarish because you're thinking of the safety. Many people will not even come. Many people will not attend. We've seen situations where uh, what, what we used to call our traditional weddings and the rest of them being moved to township because people do not feel safe in their own hometown. And how do we address all this? And mind you, when I talk about insecurity, it has nothing to do with political parties because even the APC themselves are not safe. And the chief security officer of the state who has overwhelmingly failed in securing the lives and properties of the state by his actions or his inactions has put everyone across all segments of our state, both the political, both the religious, both the student, nobody is safe. If you want to, if you, most times I find it, I find it funny that you even see most of the supporters of the current governor also being victims. The the former governor of Imo State, Ike Don Hakim's uh, vehicle was attacked some months back. He, I mean, he he is alive today because he was in a bulletproof car. How many people can afford that? That's why he's alive. But the six six policemen that were attached to him were all killed. So not even the forces are safe in Imo State. Not even the security agencies uh, agents are safe in Imo State. Uh, 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 I also saw a video of one of my colleagues, Honorable Chico for conversing for support for the incumbent governor. And I laughed. I told him the same governor that could not uh, guarantee your safety in your state. Because, I mean, he also escaped death by the whiskers. You know, his, his vehicle was riddled by, uh, with bullets. Luckily, he was not in that car that day when they thought he would have been there. One of the heads of the agencies in Imo State two weeks ago also escaped that. So now we're not talking about APC, PDP, Labour, or anything. We're talking of a state that currently, like I would always say, the only thriving sector. In fact, if there is a new sector that has been manufactured in our lexicon, it is in security sector. And in Imo State, that's the only sector that is currently thriving. 
That is the only sector that is currently thriving in Imo State, where people hardly sleep with their two eyes open. In fact, even with one, you're not sure of what's going to happen next. You see these people, even with the security personnel you move around with, your heart will skip the moment you see some kind of movement go past you. It's still in that same state that uh, an APC national uh, chieftain, Gulak, was slaughtered like a, a, a fowl while he was running away from a state where he came to uh, unscrupulously deliver the, inc the incumbents. And he was running away by 5 a.m. in a state where you have, you have a governor you delivered. So when we talk about the insecurity in Nimbo State, it is, it is scary. It's fearful. And it's been elevated for me. I feel I, I, do not want to, I do not want to directly say it is caused by one person or the other. But the question is, who, who is the chief beneficiary of the insecurity? The same person that is unable to give account of his stewardship. So the more people stay away from Imo State, the more you don't have people that will come to question what you're using their funds for. You're not being held accountable for anything. And rightly put, if you, if you do not get to power through that legitimate means, the legitimacy of the people is breached by, the, by uh, some persons in the judiciary, like we have seen. So, because, I mean, first thing first, why... Even the people that are supporting the incumbent governor, would they hand over their enterprise to him to run for them? Would they hand over their father's enterprise to him as an individual to run for, for them? The answer is no. So you're either supporting him for your selfish interest. Anything other than that, if you were to put the interest of the masses into question, then you find out that Imo is already, should be classified as a failed state. The only good thing that is still happening is at least in the ease of doing business, we're still ranking 11 under this administration. But other than that, business mortality is high. People are not, Imo State was able to achieve a 24 hour economy. Today, we're no longer seeing that. Imo used to be that the tourism destination where everybody, in fact, in Imo State, you greet the next person and the person responds in a strange language, making you understand that the person is not even Igbo. So Imo is that place that was seeing a lot of persons from across Africa. When they come to Nigeria, the next place they want to go to is Imo State. What is happening in Imo? People want to come to Imo. There was a 24-hour economy, very strong economy, both morning and night economy, was developed in Imo State. Imo has the highest number of hotels in the Southeast. Imo State, like, there is no area of Imo State that wasn't bubbling before this administration came in. Even the eight eight years, eight months of uh, making head your hand. Never saw, never saw us lament this way and run away from our state. Like literally everyone is being chased away from Imo State as we speak. You know, it's no longer that same Imo State that everybody wants to. I, I recall that by Friday, you don't even see any hotel to lodge in Imo State anymore. All the hotels are fully lodged. I'm also aware, I was reliably informed that both Radisson and, uh, and Hilton, already took executive decisions to move to Imo State to set up their stuff. After, after Marriott and Brown was already experiencing a huge uh, business turnout. So, I mean, but today, businesses are overtaxed. Business, the few businesses that are surviving in Imo are growing. They are even unable to run. If you talk to most of the people that own businesses in Imo, one, there is low patronage, two, there is overtaxing. So all you're going to do is to stifle those businesses and make them run away. Today in Nimbo State, we have hotels that have been put to, put up for sale. Today, well, in so honorable, honorable, sorry, sorry, honorable. Let me let me cut you there. You have you, you've really poured your heart out in the area of destacling insecurity. So I, I would expect that when your policy document is out, when your manifesto, your, as you are your principal uh, senator, Asan uh, Achon. When your manifesto is out, I should expect that a huge part of that document should cover tackling security. Because everyone here will agree with me that where there is no security, no other area of governance can thrive. And it's so terrible that today in Imo State, you have young people graduating universities, but they are not staying back in the state to work. If they are not going to Lagos, they are going to Abuja, which is very wrong. Imo State being a state that has lots of potentials, 
lots of bright young people, able-bodied young men and women that can uh, create businesses that all they are asking for is just an enabling grant for them to exercise their skill and bring greater value to the state. If at the end of the day, they have to like take that value, to take that skill to somewhere else where they, are, where they have to struggle and struggle and struggle for them to start their life, then I think there is really a need for a change. So I, I really want to follow the, 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 the rule of, the, of, 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 of today's space. I want to give the floor open for two people to ask questions. Then I'll come back again to ask uh, another question then We'll continue in that format. So quickly, let me have um, let me have Ogbin Naba. Ogbin Naba, please quickly ask your question and uh, let's go. Let's proceed from there. Please, you can mute your mic. You have the mic now. Okay. Um. Uh, good evening, I'm myself and everyone in the house. Um. It's a privilege anyway. What I heard of the uh, space mission, Honorable Tony Moore. I said I must be part of it. I know Tony in 2013 from Ajawa to 2013, 2014, when he also contested, we do one of these things for him. Anyway, but that is by the way. Um, I have a lot of uh, concerns in Even though I'm not from Imo, I'm from Anambra. But I know that um, Imo is more of where you will always for comfort or for one or two things. Then I'm talking about being a security in the state. And like as you two said, it means there is no security in any state. There is no arm of government that there is no arm of government that will be able to function. I know that I have been a more of a victim of the caste nation from uh, unknown government as you know. I have encountered with them. I think at the point I even went down to the their camp making a lot of demand for my car. At the point I think uh, it was later released with a good amount of money. Then I want to ask uh, an opportunity. the last election, state part of assembly election in New York. Uh, who both of them are whether by a right or whatever all the most respectable local government in this state was taken by the Then, that is smaller issue, if I might use the word smaller issue, in Nimo concerning the four parties, some people are supporting the other man, so I'm saying it's after, and I was even happy to go a few days ago. So I said, you clarify us, you have people in Nimo state who we can talk to, who we can call upon and say, you know, do this or do that. Let's go for this line and let's go for this party or for that party. But we don't even know where we are standing. As an obedient people, we don't know who we are even rooting for, whether it's uh, Ugule, Yadi, Ata, or whatever. Because at the point, they think it's Ugule. We are confused. I would like one or two to clear us. Tell us what is on ground. What talks or do level party have a new mistake? 27 local governments in those recent times, whether they write it or whatever, we are taken by APC. Then what is the play, what is the level playing ground for Labour Party? That is my question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Honorable, please, you can respond. Okay, please. I, I, the, the, your, your, I don't know if it's from your, your line, but it was, I had the latter part of your question. Yeah, he's, but... asking, he's asking for a level playing ground as in the chances of Labour okay. Party. Okay, oh, all right, fantastic. Given, given, given the that. current uh, political uh, the dynamics in the House of Reps, uh, sorry, in the, in the House State of Assembly, Assembly, where it seems like there's yeah. a complete capture by, by the Hope team. Okay, yes, yeah. fine. That was a good question. Yeah. So, thank you for that question, actually. So, you see, what happened in that election, which I also would want everybody to take note of is that um, I was reliably informed that Imo State spent over 5 billion naira executing that election, that particular state assembly election that saw uh, about 26 APC uh, state assembly members coming. And um, I was also reliably informed that each of the APC Lawmakers got about 120 million naira to ensure that they they get they got themselves reelected. 
Now, the, the funny thing about it is that these people do not know that they've eaten their cake, as it were, in this administration. Because if you go by the budgets that the most State threw up for 2023, you'll find out, and, so, and, and subsequent years, you find out that the budget for Imo State Assembly has always hovered about uh, around one point something billion. It's never going above that. And in, at the same time, when the when the governor uh, and his team allocates about one point something billion to the State Assembly, he allocates twelve billion to his office. I'm still going to come into those other details. And while that is happening, he allocates about four four million naira to the office of the deputy governor in Imo State. By the way, so. And, and lesser to education and health. Now, you see that for them that have collected that money, obviously, what they know, what they know, but they are not telling the public, is that they have taken their entire uh, constituency, constituency uh, project money for the entire four years. That's what Hope has given them in this process. You know, and um, where does that leave the constituents? Where does that leave development in those constituencies? Where does that even leave they themselves that would not have any more thing to ask if Hope is able to get away with another four years, which uh, God will not allow him to do so? Because what he has done is to mortgage, mortgage their four years. That is what he has done with that. It's not like um, elections were held in Imo State where people would come out and vote. But like I would always say to him, election election with the current incumbent will be that of uh, the motor packed out that loads people and never gets to the destination himself. Because if those people were to really tell themselves the truth, they know that the current administration would not offer anything to their constituents. And for the sake of their own... Um, for the for the sake of the, themselves and their constituents, it is only clear that they shouldn't support anything that would make hope. We've always known that hope. I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, yes I can hear you. Uh, we've always known that hope, 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 hope has never believed. Hope has never believed in in a, a transparent election processes. We saw that. We, we saw how he also was able to drag our states. Into the into the and into another hall of shame with River State during the last election, where our state was constantly in the media for all the wrong reasons. And why would you think otherwise when he himself never participated in election in 2019? I also participated and I ran as a go I ran under UPP uh, as a governorship candidate and. I can tell you that I touring 27 local governments and everything, I didn't see Hope's poster in any of those 27 local governments. Hope was busy in the hotel. You, ne you never saw him campaign. And for whatever thing that happened with the, with the help of the judiciary, the fourth person became number one. And he's always believed in, in rigging elections. And, um, but this time, I, I, more people would resist that, I can assure you. Imo people will resist that because we know that if, when other governors use the first four, first tenure to work and probably the second tenure not to work, in his own case, he has only used first tenure to, to elevate insecurity. His second tenure would only lead to consolidating insecurity. And Imo people will not allow a consolidation of insecurity in our states, you know, because clearly, Whichever way he came into governance, he's also shown uh, that he's quite inept and ill-equipped to govern the states. You know, he, he probably the time he would have used in planning, planning uh, how to govern the state, he used that in planning how to rig. And now he has gotten that that he wanted. He knows nothing to do with it, and that's why Imo State is where it is today. You know, so. As for what he has in the state assembly, you can be rest assured that that will not deter the emo people, especially the constituents that now know that their their, their assembly men will have nothing more to offer them because they have already eaten their four years constituency projects in one swap. And that is in his imaginations when he throws out, throws out figures of, uh, I mean, currently he has a figure of over 400 and something billion 
for the uh, budget, which we clearly know would not perform, has never performed under him. For the entire years he's been in that office, there hasn't been anything. He just throws, out, throws on figures. And the state assembly, are they functioning? That's the question you should even ask. Even before the election, were they functioning? What are their oversight functions? Are they doing anything? These are people that he classifies and sees as, as a school, school boys. They go to him to beg him for everything they need. The state assembly is not working. This, the, the, the entire government apparatus does not work. Hope comes to Imo State and spends two days, and the rest five days is in Abuja, you know, uh, dining and whining with the people that put him in power. So basically, it is only safe to say that we have, we have an external project being foisted on us by some persons in the states. And his allegiance is not to the state, and that is why he's not been able to do anything for the states. That's why people can afford to get killed and every other thing. And to him, it's not a problem for him. Are we talking about the state assembly people? Are they free? They, they themselves, they are not free to walk around in Imo. You see them sneaking. Yeah, you see them sneaking in uh, uh, vehicles you wouldn't even know that they are in there. They are also afraid for their lives. So what more do they think will happen to them when for the next four years there is nothing, there is no, there is no uh, agency to oversight, nothing is functioning. In fact, it's almost like when he comes to Imo State, they turn on the generator in government house. When he leaves, they turn it off. Nothing happens again. The government goes to coma until he comes the next week or next two weeks. That is all we see in Imo State. So when you talk about the State Assembly, it's funny because they are not even working. There is no capacity building for them. There is nothing for them. There are no areas they have to, to uh, uh, oversee. And the day, you, the day you try to challenge him, they unseat you. We've seen how many speakers he has unseated. The moment you talk, they unseat you. And that is it. That's at best what you see in the Imo state. So, I mean, we should also say prayers for them because they themselves are not safe. You know, they, they have um, what would have been their constitutional obligations and functions has been taken away from them. They are emasculated. They, they, they beg for crumbs. And they, they dare not challenge the emperor. You know, you, you say anything, you don't get anything. The speaker talks tomorrow, they sit, at, uh, sit by 10 o'clock and impeach you. And you don't come anymore. So that is what has been there. It's, it's more like a playground. And they themselves know that that is not how governance is run anywhere in the world. Because there's no way you're going to bring true dividends of democracy to your people that elected you if you continue like that. Now, after giving them this money is knowing that they are also not going to be elected. He knows that the problem he has caused as a state governor, his failures, his leadership failures, has rubbed off on those assembly members. That was why he had to spend that much amount of money because they were going to bear the brunt of the people by not getting reelected. He had to give them that much money. We saw a couple of them moving around with APC, police, uh, APC carriers during that period. And this also begs to ask the Nigeria police force, which way forward? Because if if we see lawmakers moving about with APC carriers, I mean, to, to what end would they be be in bed with this uh, whole thing that is going on? So, yeah, I'm sorry. So I'll, I'll quickly stop you there, and um, let's let's have um, someone else ask a question. Then uh, we'll go back to the co-host and the host for more questions. Um, let's so let's have uh, my final question. Can I? Sorry, hold on, hold on, hold on, girl. I'll come to you. Let's have uh, Obiarare Namika Onyeka ask his question quickly. Please, one minute, ask your question and let's move forward. So um, more... Yusuf, um, um, Yusuf um, thank you so much. Um, this is not even a question. I just want to appreciate Honorable Wolo. I know it's an exciting time um, to have a team of um, Senator Tana Chono and the man who championed not too young to run bill. Um, a, an erudite legislator, one who comes filled and uh, loaded with ideas. Interestingly, I was Honorable Wolo's running mate in 2019. I was Deputy Governorship Candidate of UPP. I ran with him, you know, in 2019 to see how we will salvage Imo State. And uh, he being part of this ticket is one of the most exciting things that happened to Imo State because, one, he had a global idea of what we will have done 
to tackle insecurity. And it aligned with the Akurula mantra of His Excellency, the incoming mm -hmm. governor, Senator um, Atan Achano. It on all that shows how to do, when to do, and what to do governance plan that clearly showed a timeline, a marking scheme for Imolai to be able to assess on a timely basis, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly, assess the promises of the incoming government. And uh, like Radley pointed out, insecurity is number one, and insecurity has already mapped out how it can be tackled. It's not just enough to do kinetic. We need a governor and a deputy governor who are not only statesmanly, but people who connect with the people. Tony Antonio Mulo can comfortably go to his village and sleep among his people. Atan does so. But interestingly, the governor of Imo State with the 20 APC and everything, machines and army, cannot sleep in his own village. That will show you the kind of lack of trust, lack of confidence that the people have on this APC government. He has been managed, he has managed over the last three years, three and a half years to bulldoze his way through. Ndimo alerts, and November 11th is going to be a watershed. Interestingly, the 27 House of Assembly members that he bought power for are not going to spare him. Some of them are already talking in hush hush, and we have made them to understand clearly. Supporting hope and allowing hope to come back will ruin each and every one of them. There is no legislative arm of government. And Tony Ngulu, when he was campaigning in 1999, and with what he the plan he has with uh, as Netatan, we are going to have independent legislature. We are going to have autonomous local government. Because let me tell you, one thing that builds confidence and one thing that brings trust among the people is when they realize that their representatives have say and power. And if you look at the plan that Tony and the Senator Ton Achon has, the local government chairmen who are going to be autonomous are going to be working with their legislators to determine how things are implemented in their local government area. Their funds will come to them 100%, nothing removed, nothing taken. And these guys also understand that with a governor and deputy governor that will allow them their independence as legislators, it will be in their best interest to work with the Labour Party to ensure that the emperor does not come back for a second time, because it's going to be a blitzkrieg if they make mistake of allowing him to come back. Honorable Tony Mulu, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for this space. And thank you, Yusuf and Pell, for organizing this space. I want us to do it, even if it's weekly. Let's rally the obedience. Let's rally this movement. Imo has got... See, if we miss it this time around, Imo State will regret it. Is there a time for us to redeem Imo? Abia has been redeemed. Alex Soti even... Because I was a part of the TTC. I'm still part of his advisory team. He never dissolved us. And one of the things he kept on hammering... If you look at Abia State, the only parts of Abia that has insecurity are the parts that are sheer boundary with Imo and Ebony. Abia is relatively peaceful. So the only way Abia will have peace is to bring peace into Imo State. And the peace can only happen when the APC government is shown the back door using our PVC. The same thing with Anambra. If you ask him, he will tell you most of the attacks that happen into Anambra come from Imo State. So therefore, it is the interest of everybody in the Southeast, interest of every Nigerian, to ensure that the Labour Party wins the November 11 election. I was privileged to conduct a study, independent study funded by our group in 2018-2019. Ask anybody who owns a hotel. I used over 245 hotels that were sampled, top hotels that at least have up to 60 rooms in them. They had occupancy rates of almost 90-95% consecutively for one year. Today, there is no hotel in Imo State that has occupancy rate of 26% apart from Protea. And of course, Protea has that occupancy because Protea has a lot of policy people guiding them. Imo State today is a ghost town. Imo State today is, has become the epicenter of insecurity and has become like a center from where insecurity is sold to other parts of Saudi and Nigeria. And thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Thank you once more. And of course, there is no doubt that you have capacity. I've worked with you. I was your running mate. And I'm proud to call you boss because I know with Senator Tan Achon, Imo will have a new list of life. Thank you so much for this space. Thank you very much, Chief. Um, uh, Honorable Tony, I, 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 I believe you, you really understand the expectation that the people really have for you and your principal, especially in the area of security. Expectations are high and we're going to keep our eyes up. We'll keep our eyes up because 
given if, if we are giving our mandate our votes to say okay we want this particular uh, team to come on and serve us definitely we are ready to keep our own part of the contract to ensure that the dividend of democracy is delivered uh, quickly let me give the mic to chief for him to ask his question and then we'll, we'll go around again and get more people to ask their questions chief please can you just quickly ask your question one minute to ask your question please hello chief are you there Yes. Um, Chief Nick Benjamin. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sure, I can hear you. No, can I hear you? <laughs> Sorry. Good afternoon, Tony Mulu. Um, I must say you are very well-spoken. Um, I'm very confident. I felt very confident hearing you speak. Um, I'm from Imo State, uh, or is to be precise. First of all, I would like to say thank you very much for pushing the Not Too Young to Run bill. Um, because that has helped a lot of young ones like us um, try to actively participate in politics. Um, I hear what you're saying, and you ve you sound very intelligent. You sound like someone who is ready to take take the task on. But my fear is that um, in Imo State, we've always had like silent deputies. Um, how? I think my question for you, like my first question, would be like, how do you think your ideas? will be heard by the administration when you actually get involved. Because it, I don't know if it's a cost, but we almost always have people that we don't, we don't even hear from our deputies. All we just see is the governor, the governor, the governor. So how, how can you assure me that when we even if we put you there with um, Atan Achonu, he would listen to you and listen to what you have to say? Also, um, just to wrap this up, also, Imo State has um, a very, ranks very high in um, education. How do we inject technical knowledge into our education in Imo State? Um, that, that, for me, is very important. Um, I don't think it's enough to just have graduates. Um, how, do, how can you and your principal ensure that Imo State students would, even secondary school graduates, will be very equipped with the necessary skills to compete in the wider world? We're, we're advancing into tech, different areas of life. Um, I just need to know what your candidacy and your your administration and the Labour Party have planned for these people in the in educational aspects of Imo State. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Do I take the question before another? Please go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Question. Thank you. Okay. So for the first question you asked, thank you for that. And uh, for your first question, let me also put it out here publicly. And I, I am willing, I am willing to, not just willing, I will be the first deputy governor to tender his resignation the day my boss stops hearing from me or listening to me. I've, I've also been able to prior, to, prior to my nomination, I had conversations with my principal and uh, were able to straighten out a couple of areas. At first, I told him things concerning the young people is a no-go and non-negotiable. Once it has to do with the youths, I would not negotiate anything that has to do with uplifting the youths with you. You know, and uh, that he ticks. And I told him also, I am not going to be that deputy that would not... I am, I am your co-pilot on this project, meaning that when your hands are not strong enough, I'll be there to make sure that we drive Imo to a safe destination. Now, Imo does not even have, we don't even have the luxury of time. We don't even have that luxury to think that one, one person is going to be idle. It's a team, not just me, not just him. It's a team and every Imo light, all hands on deck, uh, part of what part of what is holding our manifesto is because we want to ingest ideas from every area and all, 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 all spheres, from the religious, from the school. We, we are commissioning um, a think tank group from the school. We want everyone to make input enough, enough about manifestos that do not represent the will and the aspirations of the people 
enough of manifestos where you have just a team of five persons or ten persons voice what they think is good for you on you. No, we're engaging every segment of our states from the traditional rulers to the uh, all institutions from the formal to the informal sectors. All of them are getting involved in our manifesto drafting. So we're able to capture that. Part of what we intend to do in the next coming weeks is to hold town hall meetings with all of these, like I say, both the formal and informal sectors, including the diaspora, because they are very important. As a matter of fact, they are very, very important component of what we're doing. We are hoping to drive a private, a private, um, a, a PPP model, but mostly a privately uh, led economy, because at the moment. In most states, in most states on, uh, on our debt to borrowing ratio, no, no, no bank is even willing to give him more money anymore. That's the truth about it. Like we've exhausted our quota when it comes to that. Imo, everybody would avoid Imo when it comes to doing business that has to do with them borrowing Imo state money. Uh, the, this current administration has almost borrowed. Uh, I mean, it has gotten our, our foreign debts up with about 50% from the time it took office. So you see, we uh, uh, that on that on that particular debt borrowing ratio, we're we're not, we're looking off completely. So the only way we can even revive the economy is to win the confidence of the people and have them come back to invest in immigrants. You know, so that that is that. And on what you asked about the vocational, it's quite out. Thank you for that too. Um, I know that as at, as at um, 2021, Imo states needed to quickly create opportunities for over 300,000 youths. As at 2021, who are currently unemployed or underemployed. Now, taking it to this year, it has increased more. We're looking at close to 500,000 youths that are currently unemployed or underemployed. And the government should not be in the business of employing persons like we have seen in this administration that has seen their, their overhead costs and their personnel costs rise tremendously from where the child left it. Instead, the government should be in the business of creating enabling invest uh, in environment for investors to come in and invest and develop the state further. So vocational... Academies, of course, basically we would also have ready partners for that that would come in and equip our people. Part of our vision for Imo State is to have to turn Imo into the Silicon Valley of Africa. We have dynamic young people that are ready to take up the challenges. We've seen what is happening in Yaba, Lagos State, uh, you know, and the over over a hundred million dollars is turned turned in or out there annually. Nothing stops us from having that in Imo State. Unfortunately, when you talk about education, I had someone uh, make mention of education, Imo being one of the top. That was then. I don't know when you when you lost track of what is happening in Imo State because as I speak to you, Imo ranks second to the last when it comes to education. Uh, GDP per capita on education is is about three hundred, about three hundred and five for there about naira. As as I speak to you. As I speak to you, and that is the lowest you can think. While a Bonnie State's GDP on education, by, by capital on education, is about 4,000, Imo, Imo State's own is about 300 and something naira. Is that not laughable? You know? So, uh, I mean, I don't know the last time you heard anything about education, but Imo State has declined to the lowest when it comes to education, as I speak to you. Imo is no longer where it used to be. It used to be good under under previous administrations. But the moment it got to this particular administration where we are contesting the bottom, like 35 out of 36, same with the health care sector, you know, our, our okay, GDP. Um, I'm so sorry to interject. Thank you very much, Anirbe, for your response. So 
um, we will, you will have more time to speak, but um, I'd like to just uh, move ahead by passing the mic to another person to ask a question. And usually when I have spaces, I like to have a little mixture of both genders. And there is a lady right here on stage. I'd like to pass the mic over to her to ask her questions. So hello, Angel Kelechi. How are you doing today? Angel, are you there? Yeah, hi. Good afternoon. Hi, Honorable Tarnu. Um, I have a question to ask you. So throughout your campaign, how much representation in youth will be displayed? You know, a lot of people say, yeah, they want you to be a part of it, but, you know, talk is cheap. Uh, did I just lose you? Am I the only one that lost you or others did? No, oh, did you, you're not the only um, Kelly, can you start all over because we sort of lost you? Okay, sorry. Um, I My question was, how much representation for the youth will be displayed in your campaign? You know, a lot of people talk about youth and wanting the youth to be very involved and of course youth want to be involved but talk is cheap you know it's all about action so how much representation will be uh in for the youth yeah i i can tell you it's going to be something that will make you happy at the moment i'm still uh i'm still i'm twisting my principle to ensure that uh what the the first interaction with the young people the they requested for 60 percent and um yes and i am um, at the moment i'm having that running with my principal and i can assure you that coming back to you coming back to you you will be happy with settle with that i can assure you okay, okay. thank you so much Right. Thank you very much, Angel Kalichi, for that very good question and thanks for answering, Honorable. So moving ahead right now, I will pass the mic over to um, Chidildi. Chidi. Yeah, please. Uh, good evening to everyone. You still hear you. Honorable, my greetings to you. Uh, thanks for coming today. I mean, I, I've been one of those disturbing uh, sister in the India on her Twitter handle. We need you guys on board. I'm from Abia State, uh, but uh, everything concerning South is, is, is matters to me. I quickly I want to ask this. Um, I'm not going to ask anything concerning the manifesto, but we all know what is happening in most state. And my question is, um, based on what is happening right now in Tribuna, what are your team and you and your principal doing concerning transmission of results? Because for me, it's very key to me. What are your team doing to make sure INEC is mandated to transmit result from the polling unit, live result, not going to coalition center. Because you know your governor very well what he can do. I saw what he did during the um, National Assembly election. It was sad. So trust me, transmission of results will give LP victory. Forget about uh, the people saying no, this, no. We saw what happened in Enugu, Enugu State. Nobody expected it. But we won that election. And I want you guys to work hard on the transmission. So what are you guys doing, number one? The number two, the man that lost out on the primary, I want to understand that he has also his own followers. What are the team doing? What are the party doing to appease him or negotiate with him to be able to bring, on, bring in his own supporters to support this? Because what matters is to rescue the state from these people. It's very important to me. Thank you. All right, thank you. I uh, thank you for that question. For the um, on on INEC, I believe um, we'll all watch. Uh, currently, I I have always said it. If there is any agency that deserves uh, to to have uh, a prominent sitting position in the Hall of Shame, it should be INEC for what they did during this last election. And I am hopeful that again they will find um, they will find it's important for them to even begin to attempt to redeem their already already uh, compromised or battered image so to speak it's um we all saw what happened and how the the amount of money that was put out for the beavers and all of that and considering considering the incumbent whom we know 
believes that what money cannot buy, what mo more money can buy it. We're hoping to see how much INEC is willing to ensure that insecurity continues to thrive or even gets consolidated in Imo State. But I can assure you that the, the Imo people that we've reached out to are willing to resist every form of uh, uh, whatever thing the INEC might want to do. One, the beavers must work. Secondly, because I mean, uh, it, it, again, again, when we talk about the security agencies that work on election day, it also calls to mind that if for any reasons, the security agencies have even an iota of respect for those of their colleagues that has been slain in Imo State in the line of duty, they should also, interestingly, you're calling from Abia State, but I always tell people that the, the problem we all experience in the Southeast starts from Imo State because unless the insecurity in Imo is fixed, you know, we've had Soludo come out to say that the people that come to attack in Anambra come, comes from Imo State. I don't know how true that is, but the truth is that until those agitations, which I would rather see it as, until those agitations are resolved and resolved honestly and dispassionately. I don't think any part of uh, Southeast is safe. And we will not allow INEC, for whom we've uh, seen their uh, uh, interesting, interesting reputation for uh, the interesting reputation they've been able to uh, harness for themselves lately. We would also ensure that we would, um, because I mean, you, you can't leave your states which is quite peaceful and come to our states to ruin it. So I want to believe that everyone that is coming from INEC, including the leadership of INEC, would know that. I also want to use this opportunity for those of you, because like I said, this is, um, we, we, we're facing an existential threat. So for those that are also on this uh, Twitter please, spaces, please, if you have access to uh, all the people you can reach out, including the, uh, foreign agencies, observers, and the rest of them. Please, there's nothing you do for us in Imo states that would not be appreciated at this point. We just need to rescue that state. Rescuing Imo state means rescuing the entire Southeast. Rescuing Imo state means that you can finally come home to wherever you, you belong to in Southeast. And truly speaking, too, rescuing Imo state also means rescuing South South and other places because uh, an injustice to one is injustice to all. And if you never get to tell, your sister might get married to an Imo man and then and something happens to your brother, your brother-in-law. So, I mean, wherever you are in this country, whether you're Yoruba house or because we intermarry and all of that, please, this is a clarion call. Imo state is under siege. At the moment, we have an emperor that has driven everyone away from Imo state so that he is not held accountable. We have an emperor that wants to consolidate insecurity by winning his uh, winning an election by all means. We have an emperor that has run the state dry and continues to run, run the street. Uh, I mean, he has, he has those that put him in power that he needs to settle. So please, this is a clarion call. Everyone, all hands on deck. You talked about those that are, that are with uh, my brother. Quite frankly, this is democracy. People are entitled to follow who they want to follow. But at this point in time, let's understand that this election is not about party. It is not about Abga. It's not even about APC because even those in APC are not safe. So I'm also calling on them. It's about one individual that was not supposed to be there in the first place. One individual that some external forces forced on us. One individual that has raped the entire state and wants to continue to rape the state. It's about one individual that has made sure that neither, not the, not the clergy, not the religious, not the students, not anybody is safe in Imo, not even the traditional rulers. Lately, he has also gone ahead to, uh, I mean, what we've seen is someone that is ready to ensure that you do his bidding. We've heard of meetings he's held with traditional rulers where he has mandated uh, them to make sure they, they turn. I don't know when traditional rulers has become partisan in the way that you're also turning them into your party agents. But this is happening in Imo State. And you dare not challenge or question him. So we have someone that has gone all out to ensure that 
Imo State. We, and when I say this is not about poly, uh, party, Rocha Sokoracha was a member of AP, or is a member of APC, and he was also the governor of that state. For whatever Rochas did or didn't do, the truth remains that the sanctity of lives were also preserved in that state. People could come and go out freely. It was never like this. But today, if you're planning a burial of 10 million naira in Imo State, you have to set aside another 10 million naira for insecurity or for the security of that. You have to secure even the cops or else they... I mean, there's a whole lot that is going on in Imo that is not being reported that is not being reported. Uh, are we going to go into the infrastructural decays and the rest? I'm waiting for the organizers of the of this uh, this to go to that direction because I don't want to get into areas they've not gotten into. But the truth is, I am making this passionate appeal. If you're in any party, just mind you, politics and elections is all about numbers. The primaries have come and gone. If we cannot embrace ourselves and say, you know what, in one common purpose. Let us remove this one individual person that has made sure that you and I are not safe. That is my concern. My concern does not really go to which party is this or which party is that. No party is safe as a matter of fact. So, And there is no trophy for coming second or third in an election. It is just about the numbers. If those numbers do not count and they don't come into one vote, every other vote you casted in other places is wasted. At this point, if we have um, a unified approach and we're all coming together to say, you see, this is a common problem and we're going to fix this common problem by removing this common headache that we all have, this common person that has tormented us, this one single person that has taken away sleep, this one single person that has collapsed our businesses, this single person that has made, that has led to the killing of a lot of people in Imo State, too numerous to mention, from the security agencies to the uh, traditional rulers, We've seen all forms of barbaric killings going on, and yet unable to. Because if you're, if you failed, ideally, ideally, in in a sane climb and with a sane person, there are times you find out that look, I'm overwhelmed with leadership and governance. Let me just resign. I have nothing more to offer the state, because you're the chief security officer of the state. And when you failed, let's say you're the security officer of a plaza, and constantly, constantly armed robbers keeps going there. It means you're not securing the plaza well. It means your efforts and your tactics are not working. So if you are not able to secure your states and there are constant loss of properties, constant loss of lives, then you have failed in that one single job that makes you the chief security officer of the state. And I, I, I want to ask everyone to join hands. Let's enjoy and ensure that this one single person that has taken our state from where it used to be into darkness is, is removed. Because clearly, we never voted him in the first place. Imo never wanted him in the first place. So whichever way he got in there, if those people are going to bring him again, let us watch and see. But at the moment, let our will prevail with our votes. Let's, let's, speak, let's speak in one voice again, like we did the last time. Let us speak in that same one voice. We did that, and we voted for Emeki Hedio. I, I ran that election. I lost, and I congratulated him. I congrat in fact, I was among the first that congratulated him. And for the eight months he stayed there, we never envisaged that a time would come when Imo people would be so scared, like, come, let us go to Imo State. Your, your heart will do shame. You don't even want to think of it. How do you even begin to plan? Like, you put it in prayer fast for like a week and thereabout, and then get other prayer warriors to pray for you that you're traveling to Imo State. That is where we are at the moment. And until we're able to recover our states, recover our states from external forces, because as far as I'm concerned, what is who we have in Imo states was externally put on, not from Imo, but I mean, it was an external factor that brought him to Imo states. And we must also resist that external factor by coming together and, and uh, removing him. Please, That's everybody, all the people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Honorable, for that response. I agree with you. We seek for um, we seek good governance and the betterment of the quality of life of the good people of Imo. So moving on real quick, I see lots of people requesting, and some are in my DM. We will try as much as possible to pass the mic around to as many people as possible. And um, but right now, let me pass the mic over to Benjamin. Hi, Benjamin. Uh, Madam Pears, good evening. Uh, good evening, Mayor. I'm Deborah Yusuf. 
Um, my honorable, good evening, sir. Um, the situation in Imo State is so pathetic, and um, the Imo light actually in a year for a change. I'm very happy that you are one of those people that uh, pushed that bill of not too young to run. And uh, we can actually see the, uh, the positive effect from that bill to today, which brought in a lot of um, young politicians into the National Assembly and the Red Chamber. In 2011, 2012, I was drafted into Imo State. And I can tell you, those two years for me was like I went on a vacation. That was nothing like security threat, I can tell you that. I'm very happy that you are engaging with the electorate right now because it will enable you to draft your manifesto that we address the need and the priority of the young Imolite. The problem in Imo State that you guys actually need to solve or rather look into or to campaign with, I would say, is uh, the security insecurity that is currently ravaging the entire state. I'm also a governorship aspirant in Edo State in 2024. I will, I will advise you, sir. I know you are more experienced and you have been there. I will advise you, you, you draft a manifesto or a policy that will actually have the 70% of the electorate, which is the youth. Because the people and the, um, the people who are committing crime and who are actually indulging themselves in this uh, insecurity in your state, has to do with the young folks. Uh, like Peter Obi will always say, when you do not take care of the system today, in the next two to three years, it will become worse more than the way it is. When the people, when the young people are not educated, when the young people are not attended to, the result is always like this. If somebody is working, somebody has a job and, and the youth are enjoying the dividend of democracy, they will not take up arms. They will not take up 5,000 euros to go and start perpetrating uh, evil and crime in different society and community where they are all living. So these are the things we need to put into consideration. You have to look into the direction of the youth. And not just that, sir. I know you, you push that bill for the not too young to run. The obedient movement is not a cash. Uh, we are not cash. We are not cash, uh, cash, uh, cash, uh, cash and carry. A group, we do not have a leader. The only leader we have is Peter Obi because we believe in his ideology. So I believe the emo light know what they want for themselves. You have spoken so eloquently, and I believe you have all the capacity, you have what it takes to be a deputy governor of Imo State. And you representing your principal is, uh, is, is commendable. And um, for you to have the obedient movement on your side, I can see for you two to even jump into this program to bring you forward and Mrs. Pels. These are the two, these two voices you have on your side. I think if they pass a message to the audio obedient worldwide will listen, will listen. So I can say you already have not less than 10,000 votes added to your own vote today. That is my own opinion. But none of us will support you, sir. None of us will support your aspiration. None of us will support you if your manifesto does not carry 70%, does not address the interest of the youth. I'm telling you this. You just better take it to the bank and, and, you, and you will have a cash out. If your manifesto does not address the, 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 the issues that surround the youth of Immolite, you will not have our support. Even we will bring you here, we will tell you the truth. Like I said, I'm an aspirant in Edo State 2024. And I've, I've gone out to look around and I've diagnosed the state. I know what the problem is. I want you to do the same. And you have spoken so eloquently so far, and I know that you know where the problem lies. In most state, people have a common enemy. And you guys need to come together to fight that common enemy. Like you said, it was not even in the second place. It was not even in the third place. And somebody just do one rig, maro, maneuver, and meander under it. And they elected, they just saw him, just saw him in. I read a book last time, and the person, uh, the author said it, and uh, I think a late Chukwe maker uh, son, uh, Ojuku's son, he said, when a power 
is given or rather when somebody snatch power he will never do good with it so when you have hope who's a demand there as a governor who was never who was never the first and second and third option what do you expect but imo have a chance imo like people have a chance and that chance is in labor party we shouldn't just say labor party and obedient because obedient and e and labor party they are not the same obedient i want to spell it out sir Obedient at well meaning Nigerians that want the betterment of Nigerian, not looking at party affiliations. When you are capable, obedient will support you. That is what we want. Because we want a country that will function, we want a state that will function. Like I said, in 2011, 2012, when I was drafted into your state, I work in that state government house and I work in Olu. I can tell you, every day was just like a vacation for me. People were so friendly. You can, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can barely go to your place and say, oh, I'm tired, let me go home. Everything was normal until um, you guys had this entire... I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interject, Benjamin. Do you want to round up in 30 seconds? Thank I'm you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Al. Uh, thank you, Honorable, and thank you, Madam Pels. I will say I wish you good luck, and we'll be here to hear from Ms. Pels and, and my, my dear brother Yusuf on how to continue to push this agenda forward and render you the support that you want. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you very much, Benjamin, my brother. So, guys, just so you know, Benjamin is also going for a state go um, governorship. So, he is aiming to get a ticket for Labour Party for a state. I wish you the very best, my brother. So, moving ahead, I will pass the mic over to Ibeawichi Chikodi. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Ibeawichi. Yes, uh, thank you. You are, you are um, okay. Bells, please encourage ladies to also request for the mic. So, let's have the gender balance. Absolutely. I've said that before. Yeah. I just really like to okay. have conversations with a mixture of both genders. Yeah. I see Ure. Ure was here. Very she. Okay, Ure is requesting right now. I'm going to add her back. So ladies, please, if you want to join the conversation, I see next, I'm going to add you as well. Please do well to request for the mic and join us here. I don't want to be the only lady on stage. I don't want to be lonely out here. So please do well. <laughs> My <laughs> own sister and friends to join me here. So, um, Ibabuchi, you have the floor. Please go ahead. You've got two minutes. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to waste time. Um, thank you, uh, Honorable. Thank you, the space, Honorable. I want to tell you categor uh, categorically that the obedient movement in Imo State, as of today, we are not seeing much from your camp. All through the space, everywhere. I don't know how long you have been with uh, uh, Senator Atta uh, uh, when he was elected, uh, when he picked you. But since that time, since that election, to tell you the truth, if you look at people that are in this space, yeah, thank God for those who brought you in. Do you, how do you connect? Because I know what you did was very important. How do you try as much as possible to get that voice to tell you the truth, as of today, the voice of the obedient movement in Imo State and outside Imo State is almost from Gerard Ogule. I don't know how he did it because of he has been coming to space. He has been respecting the movement, sharing his ideas from the onset he declared his intention to today. That, that's why we are having some problem in Imo State. Please, try as much as possible to whether underground or whatever, to see how you can connect with the obedient voice. Because as far as the obedient voice in Nimbus is concerned, it's almost on his side. Secondly, second question I want to ask, sir, since you um, join his uh, move, his party, you uh, become his uh, assistant, have you, were you able to reach out to all or encourage him to reach out to all the aspirants that we are within, because that is very key. To tell you the truth, I can I always communicate to my people. I'm, I'm from Imo, I'm from Owe. As of today, people are not very very connected with Atan. They are they are thinking that Atan is connected with Hopos of them. As of today, you may come here to come and try to clarify what they believe in both the space and at home is that. Atan is being used by Hopo Zodima to hijack uh, the boat. So people are not very, very connected. They are not very, very comfortable. So I know you have a lot of work. 
and Adam has to come out openly. We are not seeing him, him much with uh, P2B and uh, the Labour Party nationally. We are not seeing what is going on. We are not seeing a, m most of his movement. So there is need for him to come out openly. I don't know. Maybe he's the, he's the, the shy one. Maybe that's how he works. But there's need for him to connect with obedient uh, and then also the Labour Party. We really want to rescue him state. And there's need for him to really start working very seriously. To connect with Timo State Obedience and Labour Party and also Obedience Worldwide, I think it will help him because truly all of us are tired of Popo Zodema and we know what he's doing. He's just trying to show up. So please, there's need for you to try as much as possible to help him to connect with Obedient Voice, in Mose, which is not belonging to Nigeria Ugle, and also try as much as possible. We are not really, for now, we are not really uh, much concerned about the manifesto. Of, yeah, it's very important, but what we are, are very, very concerned is how to make sure that that election that was rigged in the last uh, state assembly that we do, doesn't repeat uh, repeat, uh, repeat itself, uh, itself again so please try to see how you can tell your uh, connect with everyone i eat back thank you very much okay thank you very much you see before we started or when we started this space that was the very first question i asked them um, honorable regarding um the connection Athan has with um, hope uzodima and the allegation of a million dollar Bribe. So he spoke about that. But Honorable, do you want to speak on that a little more, especially when it comes to connecting with the people of Imo? You can hear him say people are more connected to the general. So what do you have to say about that? All right. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you for those concerns you raised, my brother. You see, I, I must also state one thing clearly. Prior to... Uh, uh, my principals, Neta Tan, joining the race. Mind you that um, General Bunewe had been there. He didn't join the race at the same time they did. That's, um, that's one point to take home with. And um, quite frankly, a, a lot of people were, were believing that, well, since he had come in, uh, mm -hmm. nobody saw Senator Atan coming in to the race. We must state that clearly. But yes, he has come in and he has won the elections. Like I stated earlier, election, the primaries have come and gone. Uh, people are entitled democratically, they're entitled to pursue their, their ambitions across any other party as constitutionally uh, allowed. Then if uh, General Ogunewe, whom currently is in AA, I was meant to understand, is pursuing his ambition. And I cannot come to the space and deride him, like I said. One, he's had a Stalin military outing and all of that. But when Pell asked the correlation, I was able to put that out there, that coming from the military does not necessarily uh, mean that you will do well in governance, no, there, there, there is no, there is no yastic to show that that is one on him. And you must also appreciate the fact that he even come out to, he came out to run, run this election because I mean, at the, at the moment, everyone is concerned. The same concerns I'm expressing here are the same concerns he's expressing, same as all other candidates across other party lines. I only see people that are all coming together to say no. Hope was that they must should not be allowed to consolidate insecurity. That is all I see. So I don't see in, in, in LP, we don't see General Ogunewe as an opponent. No. Rather, we see him as a co-agitator. And we're only agitating that look, we must rescue our state, same as we see all other candidates of the party. So when you say reaching out to people, you see, it's so funny that when which we must all accept and tell ourselves the truth. Imo State is not at that space where you come in today and you, you sit tight and you want somebody to come, like, I, like in 2019, where people will call you, hey, come, you have not come to consult me. If I don't come to consult you, don't worry, security will come to consult you. That is where we are at the moment. I mean, everybody is seeing it. It's either we get it right, or the wrong things that are happening will be amplified more. 
So this time, we're no longer having people sit tight in their comfort zones and expect uh, maybe uh, uh, Senator Tan or Gerald Ogunewe or myself or anybody, any of the candidates to come and appease you and tell you, no, come and join. You not joining is an injustice to yourself, injustice to your family. That is the first thing we must tell ourselves, that the people, it takes... It takes courage. It takes courage. It takes bravery for people to come out to even vie for office against someone we already know his antecedents and his means and ways of doing things. All of us out here are putting our lives on the line, including the general himself. We're all putting our lives on the line to salvage emo states. Some people have to do it. So I would appeal both to the obedience in emo states the obedience worldwide. I have called that as a clarion call. This is not the time when you would wait to be asked. I love your last, your last paragraph. I mean, it endeared me more to you when you said we need to rescue Imo. And you're from Imo, so you're admitting that Imo needs to be rescued. You're admitting that we are tired of these insecurities that has been amplified, that has risen, I mean, that has been institutionalized. And we all want it not to be consolidated. And that's what we all want. Please, I also want to use this same platform that you pleaded me to plead my principal to reach out more. To also plead you and every concerned emo light, this election is election like no other. This election is an election that we either take, take worth, take back our states, or, I mean, I, I, can't even, I can't even imagine what will happen next because if we allow him to go through this and he consolidates insecurity, what it means is that after his tenure, he will find another stage of his and put in office. And people like you and I will not be able to go home. I do not know how many bulletproof cars you have. But the truth remains that there are, in most states at the moment, the poverty rate is very high. We are ranking almost the top when it comes to poverty in the state. Mother and child mortality is high. Our health, our GDP is about 500 and something. Sorry, we, need, we, need, we, 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 sorry we have to cut you. Uh, please, I'm from, so sorry. Uh, we, we still have more people that are, uh, I want to ask questions. Please, if you're from Imo State here, please, you are the reason we are here tonight. Please request for the mic. Oh, and sorry, sorry, to, please. please. And, and sorry, you too. In conclusion, I want to say okay, this okay, to the last caller, please. All hands, this is not about Molo, Achano, uh, Agunewe. No, this is about the soul of Igbo state. And like I said, one vote that is wasted, if you have five persons in a pool and APC gets, I uh, hope Ozadema, let me not even call APC because APC is not on trial here. It's hope Ozadema. If uh, hope Ozadema gets 1,000 votes, and uh, Atan gets, uh, Senator Atan gets 800 votes, and another Ogunewe gets 500, and another person gets 300. If all of those votes are combined, you see hope that they are out of the space. So the need for us to galvanize and consolidate our votes becomes important and imperative, especially in the times that we are in at the moment, and not about who came out first, who honors the space, Space, Twitter spaces is a very safe space, but trust me, it is not safe when you want to ply from the airport going to Olo. You'll find out that the Twitter space you're in is the safest space you can be in. I recall telling one of the APC chieftains in Abuja recently that, look, I'm willing to pay a business class flight ticket for you to go to where, but there won't be any need to pay for your return ticket because I don't know in which body bag your body will be returned to your family. I told him that, and he looked at me and said, I said, yes, I assure you that going through three local governments in Imo State in Olo and making it alive is on itself a miracle that should be testified in all the churches. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Honorable. Please, uh, okay, go ahead, go ahead. I okay, was thinking sorry, we pass the mic over to a lady since we've had guys speak. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we, can, we can have Chioma, but before then, Honorable, please, if we can do this, uh, let's have you answer questions for within a space of three minutes so we'll have more uh, emo lights to speak. Please, if you're from emo state, please request the mic, please. You are the reason we are here tonight, please. Uh, Choma, please quickly, Ure, Choma, please quickly ask your question and let Honorable respond in three minutes and let's move forward. 
Hello, Ure, are you there? Ure Chioma Adawere. Good evening. Please, if you are there, please unmute your mic and quickly ask your question. Oh, it seems she's not here. Okay, yeah, um, I don't think she's there. Let's yeah, so on. attacker has been here. I can hear long. you. Tell. Okay, okay. Oh, she's back. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Ask your question, please, quickly. Good evening. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, Ure. Please, can you go ahead and speak? Oh, You're loud. Yeah, I, we can hear you, Ure. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. I can hear you now. I wasn't hearing you before. I can hear you now. Can you still hear me? Okay. Sure, yes, sure, sure. Please go ahead. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for having me, Pearl. Pearl um, Yusuf, thank you so much. So I think I'd like to start by saying um, the Nigerian youth adult population has really grown and it's commendable. Um, look at the numbers on this space. Um, good evening, um, Mr. Tony Wulo. Um, thank you so much, um, you guys. And I was saying that it's really commendable. Look at this space. Look at the numbers that we have here. The host. How many people here are from the East, or let alone from Imo State, right? And that for me means that we have come so far. You don't have to be from the East. You don't have to be from Imo. And I think that this is a huge blow to our political class. Um, for the longest time, they always remind us that, oh, you're not from here. You shouldn't speak. You're not from here. You shouldn't speak. But the truth is, insecurity in one part would, at least for one, increasingly so begin to affect other areas. So what is happening in my area should be of utmost concern to you. And hence, it is the most commendable thing that the person who is even hosting this space in the first place is not even from the East. So thank you very much, Yusuf. We're really, really very grateful, to be honest, right? So let my business be your business from now going forward. That's the only way that we can do this. Again, thank you to everyone on the platform. We're very grateful, Emo State people. We're really very grateful. Thank you all for taking the time out. Some places like Lagos have really enjoyed this over time. I envy them, right? So I'm glad that we're choosing to stand together. That's the only way that we can, you know, um, do this. Let's not leave each other alone. It's a collective fight. Going up against what looks like a hydra head that has operated decades on end, is this is the only way to be to stand together and speak in one voice. So someone also talked um, to um, Mr. Wulu when he was speaking to him. Um, Mr. Wulu, I'm from Imo State. I'm actually from Uber Central, so I know where the main people, right? So um, I'm excited to be involved somewhat in understanding politics. I never have really been involved or not even just in most of politics in Nigeria. So this is the first time. I actually was a first time voter, you know, so you guys should be clapping for me as well. I got my PVC for the first time and voted for the first time, right? So yeah, that okay. is it. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So someone uh, talked about how impressive you sound and our emphasis on sound, right? Um, the not too young to rule bill. I think I am really very excited to know that you push that. It means that you are very much a visionary. But I would also remind all of us that you are a deputy. I wish that this movement had started when you ran under UPP, right? Um, we saw a nice vice, and someone said that he's nice and he could pass for an ice cream man. That's how much of a jolly good fellow he was. And uh, whether or not Mr. Atonu would listen to you, that remains to be seen. So we'll just... Um, count the days as they go by and then see where we all want to pitch our tent. So the reason why people look to the Major General, Jack, is um, the might to withstand the mad emperor. You so intelligently did a good job telling us the failures of the now thankfully so exited General Buhari. But I would remind you that it was more a lack of will than it was a lack of might, right? And I'm also glad that you know that it goes beyond brandishing Labour Party, at least not after we have seen Mrs. King Gibe and then something Oga. And the reason why I'm saying something, Oga, is I'm deliberately choosing to forget his name. That's how much, you know, I don't want to be in that space. So people feel more connected to the general because there has to be a plan to foil rigging and violent attacks on election day. Yes, people want to come out and vote, but what is the plan? I don't know how much of an intelligent question that is to be asking you because we have seen, we saw that in, in Lagos where someone tried to set up, you know, security for people who are coming up to vote and then uh, it was quickly dispelled. So that's the reason why people are looking to the major general. People feel more at peace. You know, like I told you before, the reason why the major general in Asso Rock failed was not because he didn't have the might. It was because he lacked the will. He didn't want to. I don't think he didn't know what to do. He just didn't want to do it. And so he left his hands tied. So people are looking to major general um, Jack. The, the other name is hard for me to pronounce. Right? So maybe people will say, I cannot, I cannot contest the name of state because I can't say some names. But then again, that's the reason why people are looking up to him. So I want you to take this back to your, your principal. 
um, first off, we need to see him more and hear him more. The truth is, you are too intelligent to... I'm, I'm even not so happy that you're actually standing up, because it's looking like you are trying to cover. We need to hear him. We need to talk to him. He needs to be more engaging. Let's know what, what, what's up with him. Let's know what he's up to. Let's know what he wants to do about restoring Imo State's glory. Like I said, I'm from Obey, and I remember going back home often, how busy that place is. We talked about nightlife and daytime. It was beautiful, the place to do business. Now we can't say the same for it. Every time my father wants to travel, everybody is running health as and saying, I hope you are safe. I hope this will happen. You know, he's very confident because he's from Imo State, and he said, well, he gave me, he may he gave me. But we know what's up, right? So we need your principal to step out some more and um, not be in your shadows. We need to hear from him. So first off, um, the major problem that we have is what are the plans to fall? Like I said before, I don't know how intelligent that request that question is, but it's not your, you know, really your your uh, um it's not your place to do that. But see, we're in a failed country, and so we can't really rely on the security operators. But what are you doing? Do you have any plans to you know be in um tandem with the security operatives? Do you trust them? What are your plans? So this is the major reason why people are looking at the major general to say that he'll be able to push this forward. So yeah, that's what, and, and thank you. To hear you speak is really um, relieving, so yeah. Thank you so much, Pearl and Yusuf. Yusuf, thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so very much, Ure, for coming here and for your very beautiful submission. Arebo, would you like to respond to that? Absolutely. Thank you, Ure. Thank you for the, raising those concerns and the question, too. Um, thank you so much about uh, for that. So um, my principal would always refer uh, ours as a marriage between the old and the young. My principal believes that I trust me to bring in some fresh ideas, especially coming from the youth perspective. And that is one of the things that is driving this. And more so also, I would, I would commend him quite well because it's not like he wouldn't have been on this place, let's get that clear. It's not like he wouldn't have, and it's not also like he wouldn't come in, but in his own words, he said, you know what? These are your constituents. These are your, this is your demography. Go start the conversation with them. And uh, that is what I have done. And like somebody actually did st uh, states that oftentimes deputies are like doormats. But in this case, you have seen that he's not willing to use me as a doormat. Instead, he has used me to be an icebreaker. Go there and talk to your people. Let them also get used to knowing that they will be seeing you. And I mean, what we started is uh, so much so that the day you don't see me again, you can also come to the Twitter spaces and shout. We no longer hear from uh, uh, Tony Molo. It means uh, he's become a doormat which I do not intend to be, like I have stated clearly. This is, um, if if the client was sinner and right, you wouldn't be having uh, docile deputies. In fact, to the point that we have times when the governor is unable to discharge his duties and he's still on it, and he still wouldn't transmit uh, authority to the deputy. We've seen that happen oftentimes. So I also think it's a good development in our, in our space that I am talking, I would rather, I would rather we also, unless you people do not want to be seeing my face so much and then I'll end up becoming another dominant deputy because I'm sure as, as we are here, probably my principal also might be here listening or probably thinks, okay, since these people do not want to hear from all of let me be the one talking and when I'm unable to talk, nobody talks. So I... Uh, well, like they would always say, be careful what you wish, because you might get that sometimes, and you may also come out to complain. But I must I must also take our time to thank you for your concerns that you've raised. And yes, you've also talked about General Ogunewe, and like I say, this space is not for General Ogunewe. Let's even state that clearly. Both the fact that everybody is afraid for the insecurity, and that is one, one tune that has been consistent in our conversation. Everyone is worried about the insecurity because if we're going by um, fixing, I have stated that, and yes, other than semantics, I will still reiterate that being a general, a former general, does not in any way equate to you solving insecurity problems. And then for the election, the elections, we must not also place our elections in the hands of someone being a former general because that's also 
uh, that somehow informs in our mindset that we are also defeating democracy. If we are to continually promote democratic tenets and ideals, all we need is the INEC to do the right thing on the election day because we have an institution, we have a body that conducts election. All we also need as citizens and electorates is to turn out and vote and protect our votes and ensure that they get counted. It has nothing to do with... Uh, because the day we, we start off this, we would begin to see more retired military generals come up and assure, assure us that will become another redeem altogether. Somebody will come out and tell you, oh, okay, let us go ahead. Since we're having this situation, let us bring in a military. Do we also have to realize that sometimes the military can also cause such insecurity so much so that we want them to come in to be the ones to rule? So let's, let's also be a bit circumspect on, on our desires and our wantings when it comes to that. Like I said, he is free to exercise his constitutionally empowered uh, uh, from, the, from the constitutional perspective. Yes, he is free to do that. But election is about numbers. Election about, is about winning. Elections are not necessarily about semantics. Now we have a real problem. We have an elephant in the room, and we need to solve that problem. That problem going forward is that all the votes must count. If one vote, if the current emperor has 12 votes and the closest person has 11 and half votes, the current emperor consolidates his security. So that should be, uh, we should always keep our uh, eyes on the ball. What do okay, we uh, do? Sorry, Honorable. Let me, let, me, let me cut you there, Honorable. So sorry. Um, are you are you trying to tell us that um, you and your principal uh, have a better, say, kinetic or non-kinetic approach to tackle the security issue? And if you if if, if you if you feel you do, um, can you can you just give us like an overview of that? It's when are you talking about election in election day insecurity, just like what Uri mentioned. Because, I mean, she pointed out election day insecurity, ensuring that someone is able to take that out and uh, that their votes get counted. If you're talking about that, the INEC is there. In conclusion, the INEC is there. The electorates are also there to ensure that their votes are counted. That's that for that. And um, I think those are the major players, actually, the electorate and the INEC, who should, whom sh we should expect to be an unbiased umpire in this race. Now, when you talk about insecurity, I would always say, I do not know what his, um, what his uh, uh, perspectives are to the insecurity, but I know that for us in our team, it's, uh, it's something that we can fix almost immediately as we assume office. One, what is breeding this insecurity? Like I've also said, all the things we mentioned about insecurity, one person is the chief beneficiary of the insecurity. It's not like this insecurity is happening in Katsina. It's happening in Nemo State, and the 660 communities know themselves. All we need to do is to have an honest conversation where you need Peace and Reconciliation Commission to set that up and ensure that all aggrieved parties there are, there are multiple persons that you just bring up to the table and you're able to address those issues. What people need to see is sincerity and honesty of purpose in governance. And once you're able to do, deal with that, part of the ways to tackle security is good governance. Once good governance is enshrined, when you're able to allow the, the uh, three arms of government function well independently, independent of each other, and there are checks and balances, and you have the local government system function autonomously as enshrined in the constitution. A lot of these things will take care of the so-called insecurity we're seeing today. Where there are other high-level agitators, you sit down with them. I stated it earlier that if you, if you address a sociopolitical situation, unconventional situation with a conventional situation, you're only resting the day of the, the doomsday. It will still come back up. You know, and whatever thing you do, we've seen the use of force from this current administration where it's, it, it was, he stated on television that he invited the Nigerian army to bombard a certain area of your people. Does that address it? Has that addressed the insecurity? The question is no. Today we have, Imo State is probably most policed. A lot of, from one, from, I mean, every two minutes drive, you see both military 
checkpoints. You see police checkpoints. Who are the people that are suffering this? The poor masses that they also get to extort from those checkpoints. That is the truth about it because the insecurity we're talking about, those checkpoints are still not checkmated. It. We've had operation, this dance operation, Python operation, Cobra operation, all forms of dances. Yet people cannot dance freely in front of their houses in Imbo states. So the point I'm trying to make is the conventional approach has not worked. The person uh, projecting it has failed clearly and has failed to spell the institute. It's still there. We are still to nip it in the boot. And for me and my team, my principal has stated this clearly. I mean, he's a man that has investment running into billions in the state and other places. He's a man that has second and third address. We should ask the current incumbent governor which addresses he has other than political address. You know, so before people begin to ask the things about insecurity, ask what are his stakes ultimately, other than his village home in Imo State? What are his actual stake in Imo State? Would you say that he has other investments that he employed people? I want to see those people he has employed in other enterprises he has, he has run, other than politics. So there are several perspectives to this, but without coming here to sound political, because what is happening in Imo State is real. People are dying. Nobody is safe. Nobody is safe in Imo State. Nobody is immune. That is it. And we cannot come here to politicize the death of our people. No. So for every other dissenting uh, uh, voices or, or tunes that we would have, let us first understand that there are people that have been bereaved that shouldn't be, but because of the inept administration we currently have. And you cannot even blame those people around him, not even the commissioners, because they only go by mere title. The truth is that a couple of commissioners has also taken attacks from these people. So nobody is safe. They are not even safe to call themselves commissioners and walk around Imo State. So what we're talking about here is very real. And it has nothing to do with... I've seen a couple of persons come out and mention names, General Jack and Mike. Look, everyone, everyone is in unison in trying to make sure that we restore sanity and security in Imo State. That's all I can say. Beyond that... When we talk about election, I will reiterate it again. Election is about the numbers. It is not about sentiment. Any sentiment you share during your vote, you want to vote this person because you like him or you like his voice, does not help us get hope out of this place. If we need to get hope out of this place, we need all the numbers, we need all the support, we need all the votes. We need everybody to stand on their polling unit on that day, ensure that the votes that are counted are uploaded, and then the will of the masses prevail. Once that happens, let's even first and foremost get our people secure. Let's stop the killings. Let's stop the un unwarranted deaths of many people. We've seen young people. We've seen people. We we've seen couples get slaughtered. We've seen several mindless killings that should be stopped. That should be stopped. And let's begin the process of healing and rehabilitating our people. Let's begin the process of reintegrating those that feel feel uh, left out by the government. Let's start incl inclusion. Let's start diversity. Let's begin to grow the economy again. Let's grow investment. Let people begin to embrace their corona mantra, which is come home and invest. Let the diaspora begin to come home again. Let investment begin to thrive. Let our teaming youths get employed. We have a, an international cargo airport that by now we, we would have been expecting that both FedEx and the rest of them will have hubs there. That is not happening. Not to talk about our health sector. Part of our plans in our team is to ensure that Imo State becomes a destination when it comes to health. You know, I, I mean, we have a lot of capital flights going into medical tourism. That could be channeled to Imo State. Give it to Rochas. Rochas started something across the 27 local governments. The vision is amazing, but probably the execution was poor. But most times when I sit back and I try to put myself to envision what Rochas envisioned for Imo State when he set up those 27 local uh, special hospitals across the 27 local government. All I could imagine to think about is a man that was passionate to bring quality healthcare delivery. Like I said, the thought might be right, but the execution might be wrong. What I had expected other successive administrations to do is to work on that because government is continuing. But what we have in our own climate is such that one government's a governor or a regime starts something, the other regime abandons it and moves over to another white elephant project, which doesn't help us. At the end of the day, what you have is loss of taxpayers' money. 
when those projects are not evaporated. I envisage a situation where our health sector is revamped. Get world-class health management bodies to come in and take over those concession it's ppp they would make a world class where you i mean you see in state from ent to different centers endometriosis uh, uh gynecology thing uh, uh, all of them you, you know and that would also help with our uh Imo state teaching hospital who will get grants and fundings for them to even do <laughs> but one Sorry, thing is that we have to do please let we have very few in the industry that we do not require. We do not require to go begging the federal government. At the moment, Imo State is overly dependent on the federal allocation. Imo cannot function without running to Abuja every other month to collect money. Whereas Imo State, ideally, if everything is developed, has no business waiting for Abuja to send them money. Thank sorry, you. So let's let's um, sorry. Let me uh, cut you there. So we have um bring more people on board. Okay, we have um, Dr. Saint, Dr. Saint Dikachi from Imo State. He has a question to ask you. Um, Dr. Saint, please, in, in a minute, please ask your question. And Honorable, please, uh, I'll give you two minutes this time, please, to respond to questions. Um, time is not by our side. We want to try as much as possible to give as more, uh, more people the space for them to ask questions. And Dr. Saint, please, quickly, can you ask your question? Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Yusuf, and thank you, um, Ms. Pell. Um, Honorable, I greet you very well. I'm from Imo State. I'm from Owerri House, to be precise. And um, I grew up in Imo State, um, primary, secondary, then university in Abiyate, came back to Imo State. And no matter everywhere I go to, I still come back to Imo State. I was in Imo State throughout the whole period of election. And um, in fact, my in front of my house is the polling unit, and I know what happened during the State House of Assembly election, even how a lot of people lost under APP and hope we wrote all the results and everything. Now, um, thank God you've done this contested election before in Imo State and you've won. So, my question is still boils down to what you said because hope has a rigging like practice, is an expert when it comes to because for me, I like in Imo State, the reason commission is in this pocket. Is in his pocket, like hope controls every. In fact, he even in Imo State during the last election, most of APC members are people that work for INEC. Some of them intentionally delay um, uploading the results, real time results. Some of them intentionally, which is I'm speaking from what I know. So now it's not all about voting, for example, you understand, then what. Is the what are you people going to do? You and Honorable Hassan. I know Hassan to be a grassroots politician because I, I know when he contested the election and what happened between him and Owajimogu and the rest like that. So please, what tactics are you people? What are you people doing? Like, what's your tactics when it comes to fighting hope? When it comes to rigging the rigging tactics? Because it's not. I know Labour Party will get votes in Imo State definitely, and that is the comparative advantage you have over um, General Ogunlewe. Even though General Ogunlewe seems to enjoy love from the youth who population in Imo State. Like, because people in Imo State, especially the young population, sees Ata and Achona as old order. That is the truth about it. That's how they see him as the old order, like he's been there for over time and all those things. So, so what are you people doing about that? That's my question. Then one advice I want to give to you is also, you need to tell your principal to come on, on board, especially, especially to attend home. And, and organize youth event and speak to the youth directly because the reason why youth love it to be today is because he connected to us directly. He didn't send somebody, he didn't send his vice president to talk to us. He was talking to us by himself. So uh, Senator Tan actually needs to come and talk to us by himself, not sending you from the beginning. Because he is the one that will sign as the governor of Imo State, not you. Thank you. That's the only thing I want to say on my own. Okay, thank you. Yeah, please go ahead and respond, Honorable. All right, thank you. You would understand that this is a public space and you're asking me our, our strategies to checkmate uh, Hope's rigging system. Like you all know, uh, even while we're here, I can also assure you that uh, a few persons connected to him might also be here and it would not be a smart idea to come up here and tell you what our strategy is. But be rest assured that 
we are also working day and night to ensure that your votes count. We are working day and night to ensure that your votes get counted. We are not going to take those votes and your confidence or your or you even coming out to vote, defiling all odds to come out and vote. We won't take that for granted. We would also do everything within our power and might to ensure that the voice of the masses is overwhelmingly heard. All we need is for you to speak and be rest assured that your voice will be heard on that day. Just come out and do your voting. Stand by your polling booth. Ensure that your, your votes gets counted. And yes, on the other end, we are working out all the situations and solutions to make sure that on that day, we're also able to checkmate all of his uh, antiques that I can assure you. We're not leaving any stone unturned on that. And then to also buttress again and again, my principal is always willing and ready to meet. And he has shown that. I also want to believe that him nominating me is a sign that he is ready to work and partner with the young people because he knows my position when it comes to the young people, nationally and internationally. I mean, my name is one that would always resonate among the young youths and Nigerian populace when it comes to youth inclusion in mainstream politics. And anything that is devoid of that, I could recall a couple of weeks back before this nomination came through, if Ms. Pell would uh, oblige me, I would like to spill it here that prior to this, I, I already contacted Ms. Pell and I told her that I intended running a master class for young people that intend to, to run for elections in 2027. And I was going to run that masterclass free of charge. Ms. Pearl is here to bear me witness. I reached out to her and she was quite excited. And I told her, please help work out the modalities. We would be hosting spaces for young people that want to get involved in governance in all areas. And, and it was meant to be a free masterclass to to incubate, incubate young uh, aspirants into office. Today, the, one, of the, one of the youngest aspirants that was, uh, I think that is in the house currently, the guy from Enugu. I mean, he had, he had time out with me when I also shared a couple of strategies. And today he's a label, he's a label, the one we call the gala, the gala rep. Today he's there in the house of reps. And there was another one that met me at the elevator and told me, oh, Honorable, you don't you don't remember me again? I said I don't. He said that uh, I, me and you, I dragged you somewhere and we spoke about strategies, and I saw a uh, House of Rep uh, elects uh, badge on. I said, oh, you made it. Congratulations, you know. So it's something I have constantly done. It's something I would continue to do. It's something I would ensure. I want to also reiterate it here that uh, I mean I, I I do envisage because I will be judged for what I am known for. I do envisage that our administration will see a, a lot more young people, both in, in different positions, both uh, appointment and uh, elective position. That okay. is my commitment um, to the whole process. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so very much, Honorable. So right now we have over 70 people requesting for mic on this space. And we want to try as much as possible to pass the mic around as much as possible. And for one, I like to have balanced conversations. We've been, we've been having guys speak. Um, I would like to pass the mic over. Oh my gosh, the ladies we had on stage have all disappeared. <laughs> okay, um, moving on real quick, I'd like to pass the mic over to Attack. Um, uh, sorry, Pels, sorry, Pels, let's try and give more emo lights and those from emo states the mic because we are, we are actually here for them. I think we can give to Mike. Mike has been here for from the beginning of the space and He's really been hitting on me. It's from Imo. Please, let's give him the mic. Then we'll pass it again, please. Absolutely, Mike. Kelvin, you have the mic. Please go ahead. I actually wanted to give it to you before you spoke. So please go ahead. All right. Um, thank you. I've been, I've been so worried to speak. I've been so because... Okay, let me, let me say, Honorable, I know you before now. Honorable Tony Wool, I know you before now. I know you from Lagos. Can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, I know you from Lagos. I know what you stand for. I've been following you for a while. 
But I, I, let me not let me digress a little from you. You you say so much. I love your idea, but I'm I'm more I'm more concerned about marketing. Who are we voting? Who are we marketing? Let me give you an example. What we did during P2B's campaign. I, I I'm not a Labour Party member, okay, but I'm more concerned. I'm passionate about this country. I'm passionate about Imo states because this is where I schooled here. I grew up here. I'm working here. I live here. My house is here. I, everything I do, I do it in Imo states. So I'm so passionate about how these these states will drive forward. Then, then if we're going to achieve our aim, we'll start by marketing. Now, the other day, during P2B's campaign, so what we do with me and my few of my friends at my workplace? In my workplace, nobody knows P2B. I started by introducing them to him, telling him the kind of person he is. Within one week, I was able to change everybody's mind. I moved away from there. I came to my street. I started from there. The local shops in my street, I started meeting them one by one. Even to an extent, the women started telling me, please bring P2B's poster in my shop. I want to put it there because I've been preaching his gospel. I've been telling him about him. Now, last week, I took my time. I went to the streets. I started asking people about uh, uh, Senator Tan Achon. I got cold response. People don't seem to know much about him. So it becomes difficult for me to market him. Now, the last time I saw a uh, uh, indicator post about his farm in Imbano, that's the first time I'm hearing that. It was a smart thing to do. But I'm hearing that for the first I don't even know. I have to record the video. I started moving from shop to shop. Tell him, look, someone who has this kind of idea can transform our farming in Imo State to something else. Now, this is exact contents we, content, con, yeah, contents we need to promote him. Voting, yeah, is good. We're going to vote. People are ready to vote. But they need to know who they are voting. Now, when you know someone you are going to work for, someone who's going to be your governor, it gives you extra moral, extra vibe to even campaign and do so many things for him, for him to be there. But I'm telling you, most emo people... In this platform can testify that go to the street of Urena, ask people about him. They can't say much about him. And I think that is where we should focus our interest now. Publicity. Let's market this man. Who is this man we're talking about? Who is he? What is his antecedent? What can he do? What has he done in the past? Then we can pick it up from when people know him. Trust me, they can go into any mile for him. Then we start to tell someone, look, this is this person. This is why you're going to vote this person. He knows ah, if I'm taking telling someone that. I know him, or he has done this, he has done that, he has done this. You get my... And this is where I'm concerned. I've been looking for opportunity to get this thing out of my mind. I've been looking for who to talk to. But I haven't been able... If you go out now... Hello? Hello, Mr. Mike. Sorry, um, we need sorry, we need to uh, stop you here so others too can also speak. We, right. are, we are far behind our schedule time. Please, right. let's have right. Attacker. Attacker has been here for a very long time. I'm so sorry, Attacker, please. You have the mic, please. One minute, please. Ask your question. Okay. Um, my question is... Uh, well, Hello, I'm Ataka, a are you there? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yusuf. Ataka LP. Are you there, please? Yeah, he's actually speaking. Yusuf, maybe oh. you can't hear him, but he's actually speaking, yeah. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, see, um, le okay, let me just say, uh, I'm a Labour Party member in Abia State, and uh, let me just make a disclaimer about... Uh, the Dora guy that is doing anti-party, Labour Party Abia State is going to make a statement about his and uh, anti-party activity. So Labour Party is not that party that can be able to conduct all this nonsense shenanigans that normally used to happen in other parties like PDP or APC. So, sir, I want to ask you a question: How are we going to campaign in um, uh, Olu Zone? Because that place, to me, I don't know how we're going to do it. Because the only place I, I can be able or some of my team are going to do something about it, mostly or key on the Uru zone. So how are we going to campaign on Uru zone? And the, the, the way that we are going to campaign, because the content that we are also going to campaign, and also, I also want you to also plead your principal so that he can also be coming to his, to his space and also tell a lot of people about himself so that some people can be able to calm down about all this, the propaganda they are going to put, uh, they are, talking about him because to me it's really speak very bad of him and to me i i don't really like it and that is the reason why i normally used to have problem with some people talking about something that they don't know about 
a person. So I want you to at least plead your principal to bring him up, no matter what, whether they, some people feel that he's, he's old or other or not. For the mere fact that you, you have already chosen you as, a, as his running mate, and that is one of the things I like so much. So please, we really want you to. We want you to bring him to the space so that he can be able to talk about himself and so that we can be able to use what he talks about and his citizens and the rest of them so that we can be able to use and compare for him aggressively and rigorously so that um, people also know about him, even other states, because sometimes it's not only Imo State that is going to compare for him too, because other people that is also voting in Imo State are also living in, in Abia State and Court. Um, I can I can assure you ab about that because some of my friends I also stay in a court. They normally used to vote in Imo State, so that is the one of my questions. That is what I want to ask you, sir. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, okay. Yeah, please go ahead. All right, thank you. I will start from the the previous caller. So, mm -hmm. um, first thing first, uh, my my principal is a a man that against all odds has been able to but then like i said i won't be speaking for him he would attend the spaces be rest assured that he will attend the spaces and he will speak for himself he he he's very intelligent he's very smart he has um he has been through all that you can think of even as a young person even as a youth you recall that he is also someone uh, that is physically challenged and not by his own doing or uh, natural, no, but someone that was a sa of service during the Civil War. And for most people that would always question where, where did one of his arms go to, he actually lost that arm to a grenade during the Civil War. And uh, against all odds, even with that uh, challenge, he was able to beat it. He's been he's been through a lot, and most especially, he is a man that is tenacious. He is a man that is not um, he is not afraid to fail, because he will always tell me, "I have failed severally, and I have risen severally." You know, and he is also someone that is very passionate about the state of affairs in Imo State. As a matter of fact, amongst all the contenders, he's the only one that has a stake in Imo State. And I make bold to say this. And not just a stake. He has stakes running into billions of Naira in the state. Running into billions. Someone just mentioned his uh, greenhouse farming, uh, which I believe he would explain more. And there are video evidences to that. This is a man that has probably... The, the biggest greenhouse farming in West Africa as we speak and intends to do a whole lot more. He has, he has investments, like I said, he has addresses. He's been, so when people mentioned, mentioned hope, giving him $1 million, it is laughable for a man that has investments running into, um, into several billions. Uh, in fact, in estimate over $9 billion invested in the states. So I, I would rather want to ask someone before before Hope's uh, selection at the courts or as, uh, ascension to where he is today, for people to come out and also point at what his investments are. I do not want, like I said, this space has nothing to do with other governorship candidates. Truth be told, everyone that is running for office is running because they are tired of the insecurity in Imbo State and they believe they can do a difference. And at some point, I believe some other parties will also come to join forces with us because we're pursuing one single goal and obligation, unless, of course, they have other agendas where you might be used to divide votes or you might be used to suppress votes from a particular quarter. Other than that, if you're, if you're looking at rescuing Imo State, at some point we'll all come together and work it out. For the campaign in Oluzon, we're not going to leave the people in Oluzon because they are also endangered. The same thing we're talking about, the insecurity in Oluzon. People in Oluzon are also crying out for the insecurity in their areas. I mean, they are unable to work, they are unable to do things freely, they are unable to apply their businesses. So, would we abandon our brothers in Oluzon because 
Olo has been turned into a theater of war. No. Are we going to abandon it because it's, it's been overrun by insecurity? No. You know, we would also do what we need to do. I believe, like I said, that on that particular day, the people of Oluzon would also come out to vote. And they will vote because they want to be out from this bondage. They will vote because they want improvement in their in their quality of lives. They will vote because they want their zone redeemed and rescued. So, yeah, honorable, uh, sorry, please, let, me, let me stop you here, please. Um, honorable, you. please, uh, I want us to go for another 30 minutes. I know we are far behind. Uh, we, 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 we far gone, gone um, beyond the agreed time, but um, please, let's add extra 30 minutes and let's give the people the chance to to really engage you and get a, a broader view of your of, of your, the aspiration of you and your principal. So please let's let's go another thirty minutes, please. Uh, let's have Mr. Kelvin. Yeah. Mr. Kelvin, I don't, please. I don't think he's hearing you. I think there's a little um, glitch. I heard you what? clearly. I heard you clearly. Okay. okay, okay, okay. That's great. That's great. Thank you. So let's have Mr. Kelvin. Mr. Kelvin, please, in one minute, please ask your question quickly. Good evening. Please, you have the mic. Yeah, thank you, Yusuf. My name is Kevin. I'm speaking from New York. I'm from Imo State, or local government to be precise. And um, on two occasions now, I've been back home, but I couldn't get to my house in the village. So the insecurity in Olu Zone is um, something personal to me. But the feelings, or the feelers getting from home is that uh, Senator Atan and Uzodima are one and the same. That's just the truth. That's why there is this lukewarm attitude from the people to rally around him. The obedience that stood with Peter B are finding it difficult to work for Mr. Atan. So, um, Wolo, this is my first, I know your name, but this is my first time hearing you speak and you sound like an intelligent man, uh, someone that knows his onion. So, I don't know how you're going to do it now because the ball is now back to you guys to convince us that there's something different for you because fillers from home, my uncles, my relations, I schooled in Oweri. I, I went to Futo. So I, 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 I know him was state too well. So the fillers we are getting is that Atan and Uzadima are one and the same. So please, how can you prove us wrong? that Senator Tan is different. And again, I want you guys to win, not because um, 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 Uzodema uh, is, is, I mean, from what people are saying that Uzodema and Atan are not from the same camp, but who wants things to work. As I said, 2021, I was in Nigeria. I couldn't go back to my house in the village. Last year, I was in Nigeria. I couldn't go back to my home in the village. I lost my uncle. I went. I get to Nigeria. I stopped only nowhere. I couldn't go. I couldn't get to the village. So it's, it's it's painful to me. So I'm asking, how can you assure us that Senator Tan is not a placeholder or working for Zodima? Thank you. Yeah, honorable. Please, before you before you respond to that question, I think a better way that we can uh, really get more people up and uh, and save time. If when uh, we get like three or four people to ask questions, if we could just jot down and answer, um, uh, answer all the questions once and for all, so we don't have repetition of questions and repetition of your answers. I don't know if that works for you. Yes, it does. Okay, so now let's have um, another person ask their question so that at the end you just answer everything once and for all. Let's ask, well, let's have Mr. Strong. Good evening, Mr. Strong, please. In 30 seconds, please ask your question, please. Okay. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you, Pearl, and everybody. Thank you, Honorable Tony. Um, interesting listening to you. Uh, because of time constraint, I'll just say that uh, I think people have really said what I wanted to say. You will not be able to speak to with for a time. You will not be able to do that, no matter how much you try to uh, do uh, speak for him. So we need to listen to him he needs to answer some questions directly from the electorates and there is something i need to really uh re-emphasize uh, you talked about all the candidates coming together to rescue emo state and that warranted a question that was thrown to you which i think you didn't answer how much have you guys reached out to all the level party guys 
that ran for the primaries and maybe didn't win, at least to sell this idea that at some point, you guys may need to come together to rescue Imo State. Have there, has there been any effort? We want to hear a clear and cut answer, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Strong. So, and address, please, your own question, please. Okay, okay, okay. Good evening, everyone. Are you hearing me? Hello, energ energize. Are you there? Yes, energize ben? yes, yes. Are you hearing me? Hello. Yes, we can. We can we hear, can hear you. you. Okay, 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 okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is my first time of speaking in a space like this. I must thank FS Yusuf, uh, Miss Pierce, and Honorable himself for giving me this opportunity. My name is. Um, Ben Chimobi. I'm from Imo State, that does have to be precise. My question is a very simple one, Honorable. Uh, what do you think uh, your government can do differently to stop the fluctuating nature of electricity in Imo State as regards to the law signed by President Mohamed Buhari, which stipulates that states are allowed to generate, transmit, and distribute their own electricity? I work with Mazda solar plant in UAE. So I know how simple it is to achieve a clean, renewable, and uninterrupted electricity in Imo State without building any water dam. Just a 4,000 megawatts of PV models plant can achieve that perfectly in Imo State. Because electricity is very crucial to the development of any serious state or nation. It attracts security. You, you, you can't be talking about insecurity without electricity. You don't fight insecurity in darkness. So it attracts investment, employment, and create room for, uh, for, 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 for tourism. So what can you do differently to give Imo State a constant electricity? Thank you. All right, then. So do we... Um, take a third person and then you answer the three of them at once. No, I think the fourth person you mean. You can take yeah, the fourth person. Yeah. Okay, are you energized? I think I lost my sound connectivity at some point. Yeah, the, there's yeah, a I had it way. There is a little yeah. glitch, but I think after a little while, you will be able to hear everyone else. Yeah, so yeah. Let, let, let's take um, Madwa Go Unzubechi um, as the last person um, before you answer. Please go ahead, Madwa Go. Okay, can you hear me? No, yes. Yes. Okay, good evening. Um, good evening, and I will not take much of your time. Um, I need to go and be there, and I speak in Futu. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Are you using any sort of um speaking or speaking device? Ah, no, no, is anyone? Because the, there's an echo sort of coming from, from, from your end. I'm dying very well. Um, no, 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 um, it's no, no, actually no, echoing. Echo okay, you can answer, you can answer. Okay, please, um, I'll give you a little time to take care of that. Um, we will come back to you. Let's take Chigozerim Israel. Chigozerim, how are you doing? Hi, good evening, Carol. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. You've yeah, got 30 hi, seconds. Can hear you. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Sorry. And uh, thank you for the host of this space. Uh, I have listened to uh, the conversations, and um, I think we're I think we're in the right direction. Um, so I am from Imo State. Uh, so as Mr. Tony pointed out, uh, we face an existential crisis, and we are hanging by the thread. Um, but forgive me if I don't share in general sentiments, optimism, and enthusiasm. As much as I am a pro LP and also a pro, I'm also pro sustainability, credibility, and votes, um, Umbano is my maternal home, which is where Achono is from. But based on antecedents, um, there's really nothing concrete that can attest to his prospects for LP and state in general. In fact, antecedents to um, authoritarian tendencies in your principle. But I'll, I'll, I'll apply my concerns for the next leadership for um, Imo State. And they are centered on some things that I'll mention. Number one is employment. Um, Imo State has held the unemployment capital of Nigeria since 2020 to date, which is a very terrible record. So um, I want to address that. Um, 
Second thing is entrepreneurship. I am a startup founder, and the ease of doing business in the states is. I would. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't be lying if I say it's the worst in Nigeria. Um, the issue of over taxation, double taxation, multiple taxation is is, is something else in the states, and it's it stifles business. It makes it difficult for entrepreneurs and founders like myself to create employment and you know expand and grow in the states. Um, this is this is our state, and so we can't just leave it and go elsewhere. So we have to build in the state. So the issue of um, unemployment and the issue of difficulty in doing business in Imo State is very high. Next, I'll talk about the use startup ecosystem and technology. Um, extreme some states like in states, Enugu, Port Harcourt, Ibandona, even Kaduna with the Kaduna Investment Agency, all of that. So, um, what are the plans for the technology and the startup ecosystem in Imo State? Um, I was listening to you speak, Mr. Tony, and you are a man of letters and you are very fluent with, with words and English. But um, talking about antecedents, your principal and yourself, uh, um, what we have now is words, words in the bank. And we want, 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 want a change in government, but we don't want a government that will just take us through survival. We need to thrive as, as a state. We don't want to survive in the next administration. So we, we don't just want to come out of, of, of bad governance just to keep surviving and see the roads and, and, and all of that. So we, we want to thrive as a state. What are your plans for this area? Employment, entrepreneurship, the startup ecosystem, and technology also. So, um, thank you for having me here. Okay, thank you very much for your question. So, Honorable, do you want to go ahead and answer the four of them? Yeah, sure. Okay, so we'll start with number one. We, uh, Senator Tan is not a placeholder for. Uh, for hope. I know that sentiments and all of that that is being shared out, but if you come to understand that uh, go, given, given to his, um, his um, outings, businesses and all of that, you would quite agree with me that there is no way it's only, like I said, when I started these spaces with you, it only exists, it's just a figment of the imagination. There is nothing like that Whoever is telling you that, like, like I, I always will tell people, the easiest way to market fake is to align it with genuine products. So when you have fake currencies, you try to interlace it with genuine currencies so that people will not dictate. That is what kites they are flying. Other than that, I, I would wrap this up by telling you a story, just a brief one in a few seconds. An old mentor in politics told me something. That once people understand that you are the man to beat, they are going to throw stones at you. Just like the tree. The tree that people pass every day and there is no fruit on it, nobody looks up to it. But the day it begins to bear fruit, even without the fruit being ripened, people will start looking up. And the moment there is a ripe fruit, trust me, everybody passing flying that route will start throwing stones at that. So that is the case between Atom and Hope. Darkness and light. They say have no marriage, or you know. So when when light comes, darkness will give this way. And the only reason, the only reason we have people, is that the devil will always try to duplicate what God does, you know. And in conclusion, point I'm trying to make again and again is whoever is aligned, with the current top administration is nothing but evil to Imo State, and ours is not where they will find the shelter. They are on their way out. These are the last struggles of a drowning man. We, we, we are not, now I can say we, we are not a placeholder for him, and he can find a place, not in us, not in Imo, come November. Now, um, again, I repeat, I am not speaking for my principle. I am here, all by myself, invited by Pearl and Yusuf. Um, I'm standing on mine, and he will come to address spaces when they reach out to him. In this case, they reached out to me, probably because of my outings and my relations with the young people and the fact that I am the deputy governorship candidate aligned to my principal. I am not here because they invited my principal and he told me he didn't delegate me to come to the space on his behalf. So let's me 
state that categorically. And Yusuf and Fels are here to attest to that. They didn't reach out to him and he asks he to represent him. I am here representing myself and uh, uh, in, on my capacity as the deputy governorship candidate. That is what I am here for. I'm not representing my principal in this space. That stated, anybody can reach out to him and I believe the way they reached out to me, they will also reach out to him. And that is why you've not heard me speak much concerning the things he will say himself. Now, on the third one you raised about reaching out to other Labour Party candidates, I am aware that that is currently ongoing. And we know the things about politics, other than the movements that obedience is when it comes to politics, is a bit dicey. Uh, politics is about interest. So you should expect that those people that also came to run would possibly have one or two gray areas they want sorted out. So, and I also believe that in the fullness of time, they would all join us to ensure that we rescue Imo. But whether that conversation is ongoing, that conversation is ongoing. I'm aware that sometime last month he hosted, he hosted some of them at his ranch here in Abuja, and they had, uh, in fact, but that was also with the leadership of the party because I know the national chairman of the party and a few other members of the party were in that meeting and they had a fruitful deliberation and the conversation continues. And I saw you, efforts have been done to ensure that everyone is passionate about salvaging Imo. So yeah, we're all... Sorry, if you allow me to just add quickly to your response here, I just shared an update from Punch newspaper updating that Labour Party has started reconciliation process to unseat, uh, to democratically unseat uh, the, the, the current, uh, the incumbent in the upcoming election. So please, yeah, you can go to Jumbo Throne, you see the link there, you can read more about it and also share it, please. And let's start and sending hope to the hearts of, of, of obedience and let's see how to take it further from there. Please go ahead, Honorable. Thank you, Thank you for that update, Yusuf. Um, so it's in alignment with what I was saying because I know that the Labour Party National is working on that. But you know, I am also not the spokesperson for the party. So the party's spokesperson would address that. Um, what we are going to do differently to address the fluctuating uh, someone asked that question the fluctuating electricity uh, tariff in Imo state um, we must uh, recall that yes recently uh, the current the current president assented to the electricity acts 2023 I think so and uh, that act was was initially passed at the National Assembly in July 2022. And um, with that law coming on stream, it means everything about electricity is demonopolized at the moment. So people can generate, transmit, distribute, you know, and um, it's a good one for us as a state. But let's also remember that there are only three states in the country at the moment that has electricity market law. And that is uh, Lagos, Edo, and um, one other states, if I could remember, one more state that has that bill part, that, that enshrined in their, in their states, not other states. Other states do not have it at the moment. Uh, yes, but yes, would that, uh, and Kaduna states, yes, I remember, and Kaduna states. And... Um, Yes, a, good, a, a new government would benefit a lot with that because what that means is that individuals can build clusters of, um, of uh, uh, power generating plants using any method they want, whether renewable energy or whichever one they intend to. They can also operate mini grids and uh, mini power plants. I'm also aware that with that, you can uh, generate up to one megawatt, if I'm right, uh, without without using any without requiring any license, and you can yes. distribute your operations up to 100, uh, 100 kilowatts without any need. So yes, but all of that can probably happen when we have addressed the insecurity first and foremost. Because who is going to build a power grid or even a power plant in a state that is as insecure as Imo State? 
But yes, Imo would benefit a lot from that because at some point, Imo will bounce back to being a hub in the southeast once we assume office. So everything about that, I would only say be optimistic. We'll get that done. It's a good bill, by the way, and uh, Imo will benefit from it. On the employment, Imo State at the moment is ranking between 89, 89 or 90%. When it comes to unemployment of the youth, I've said that. And for us to exist as a state and survive it, we need to quickly create opportunities to employ youth, not less than 500,000 in the next four years. And that can only be driven by uh, public and private sector participation. And that is what would anchor our government. So we can, because Currently, Imo cannot even talk about, about borrowing anymore. We've reached the ceiling. We can't even, they're struggling to repay the ones they have. So who is going to borrow you more money? That is why the integrity of the next government that is coming in must not be questioned. And it should be seen in their actions and in their deeds also, because people will begin to trust you. Investors will begin to come when they know that they can trust and rely on your administration, unlike what we currently have, obviously because of the current governor's antecedents who would want to come and drop money in Nemo states, no one as a matter of fact. So you don't see those investments coming in. But every other thing you talked about employment, it's not going to happen until we fix the insecurity. But trust me, once that is done, you'll see a lot of private sector-led initiatives that will ensure that we op that will open up the states for investors to come in. And we have all the right things to do to ensure that investors are attracted. Uh, currently, the taxation is overbearing. Someone mentioned that the consumption tax and many more uh, multiple taxations. It's killing the business, it's stifling the businesses. And the reason being that there are few businesses and the government is relying heavily on IGR without also understanding the operating environment and the things that hinders smooth operations for the business owners. You don't have, I mean, you don't have the number of petrol energy you used to have. I had Dr. Nemeka chip in to talk about the low petrol energy even for hotels. 25% is actually big because sometimes, I mean, some of them, like I said, are already put, have put their hotels up for sale. So with that, you're also overtaxing these people. What you're doing is killing the business and the government wants to generate revenue that it only uses in rigging election and doing other free, engaging in other frivolous things and not developing the state. So that is what we've seen so far. Entrepreneurship, we, yesterday I engaged with uh, a young man from Imo State that has a closed down pharmaceutical factory as I speak to you. He's in United States. His pharmaceutical company is closed down. He was employing over 500 persons. But today he said he couldn't continue because of the insecurity. He received threats a couple of times and he needed to run away because he's not sure of surviving it if he gets abducted. He had to leave that factory and because he can also run it from wherever he is, he had to shut it down. That is five, that's about 500 people laid off. And that is happening as I speak to you. So I also have interfaced with a whole lot of other people that really want to bring investments down here. I, I know of a woman that has multiple factories that would have done the same thing in Imo State, but he said, she said she's afraid. That one is also employing over 600 persons. Those would have been Imo youths. And she would have been, I mean, she would have been happier that this is their roll-up project. But she's doing that in Abuja, as I speak to you. She's doing that. So when we talk about employment, and our people are busy doing a whole lot of things, we'll have people in the creative and entertainment sector. Imo State has always led when it comes to that. We have the likes of AOK, we have Genevieve, we have Vitadon, we have a lot of them. What stops us, what Asaba has taken away from us today, what stops us from having a movie village in Imo State? Nothing if the government had looked into that area because we have veterans and experts that would have ensured that today Imo State is also, I mean, huge on that particular aspect, but we're not seeing that. So most of the things you see them go to do, host events and the rest, how do they come to Imo State and Imo State makes money? But the state is not looking behind its nose. I mean, the people running the state at the moment. So entrepreneurship is not something you can think of at the moment. Multiple taxation are things you will embrace at the moment. And those are the things we are coming to cope. Because when we come in and we open up 
a decent and sane environment for businesses to thrive, have an industrial park where people are coming to, and then incentivize this whole sort thing of so that people can come in and get a breeder. We intend to attract Imolites from everywhere, including non Imolites, to come in because some hotels are actually not owned by Imo people. Funny enough, we intend to draw, uh, uh, draw investors from across, ac across, across, I mean, I mean, across, but local and foreign investors. But first and foremost, investors will not come in to give you their money when they are not sure of where they are coming in, so that tomorrow you don't take their money and change the policy. And then, or probably someone is coming to invest and gets kidnapped along the airport road with his money and then pay so much money he's only my now to him again. Those are the technology of course we have to plan to make sure that people becomes I said it before become the next silicon value of Africa. How do we do that? We have our body news. The moment is the community who will set up e hops in all the local governments. And those e hops will take care of I mean we at, at this point we're talking about artificial intelligence and of course a lot of our people will become capable. Every 10,000 coders initiative in the that means is that every other person, in fact, across Africa, having issues to do to resolve the software related, will begin to look at Imo State, just like India has been able to achieve. And Imo has always been able to have that brain when it comes to education and all that. We all know our and those the partnership we intend to pursue with our brothers in the diaspora to ensure that all the other tech giants find Imo status. We currently we have young people from the comfort of their bedrooms making over five thousand to ten thousand uh, dollars working online virtually. Nothing stops Imo youths from doing that, and I mean shunning crime and all that. All they need is someone to point that uh, point them at the right direction, and the government to enable that to work. And I tell you, all of this can be done. At the local governments we have young people that can actually support and support a tech hub within their loca localities. We have Imo youths that are doing well, both within and outside the country, that are willing to come in and invest and partner with the government. All they need is, like I said again, a sincere and honest government that is able to create a, uh, an enabling environment for those businesses. So, Honorable, so, if we allow you, you're going to be uh, you're going to have I'm us on all the seniors. Need, need to share you and your principles and antecedents. Anyways, like I would always say on that, um, eventually, no one is perfect. We all have um, one story, and people at some point in their life might make mistakes. Like I say, nobody is perfect. But the question is, everything that has to do with everything that has to do with the risk. Yeah, we all find the state we all put and I think we should focus on ensuring first of all most stay alive. It's people that are alive that will talk about antecedents. Other than that, I enjoying you again once again to have confidence in what I am my principle is set to do and bring it in the states. Thank you. Yeah, honorable sorry, I okay. Oh, oh thank okay. Thank you for uh, for answering those questions. I, I know that if I allow you, you uh, have us on a continuous educative ride on your policy direction. But the good thing is the conversation does not end tonight. It's going to be a continuous conversation as we go in the campaign proper down to on election day. I, 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 I want to appreciate you for accepting to come on this space um, from after a very short notice. And um, I also want to... Uh, uh, I also want to... And so I um, assure everyone that we are working to bring the candidate, Senator Atan Ochono, on space. Hopefully, if not uh, next week, yeah, within 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 the new week we're entering. This new week we're entering, we are planning to bring him on space. I've been seeing comments about, oh, why is he not here? Why is he not here? There is a plan to bring him here. One of the things that Pels and I really want to do on this election is to is to um, bridge that gap between the people that are running for, 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 for the gubernatorial office in the Labour Party and the obedience. So that's what we want to do. So we'll be bringing him here for him to also be engaged, drilled, and asked several questions so he gives us a clearer understanding of what he plans to do. Yeah, so thank you so much, everyone, for taking our time. We actually plan to end this space by, by 10, but uh, seeing the, the participation and the need to really give people the chance to engage, we decide to extend it by... Uh, an hour. 
So at this juncture, I would um, want to end this space. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks to my co-host. I truly appreciate you, Pels. Thanks for the great works. Thanks for the update you've given us from the court. You have one one hand on your on your daily activity. You have your another hand on the court. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate that. Thank you, everyone. And do have a good night. I hope that when I call again, we'll all come up here again to continue on this critical activity that will ensure that we are advancing our democracy in the right direction. Thank you so much. And have a good night.